call to order today, Monday, March 6th, 2023, public hearing for the City of Tampa's Architectural Review Commission. Um, welcome, I am Susan Klesmith. I am the chair of the, count of the commission, sorry, and I'm also an architect. Um, if you are here to present a project, you will have limited time to make your presentation, so we suggest being thorough but concise. When coming to the microphone, you will need to identify yourself and your relationship to the project. The commissioners will not ask any questions during your presentation and your project should be presented in the following order. The site plan, the elevations, architectural details, and wall sections. Our staff will then present the staff report and we will then ask for public comment. Following your presentation, the commissioners will be asking questions in the same order as your presentation. Please state and spell your name clearly if you are here to speak for or against a project. Please note your time will be limited to three minutes, so take some time now to summarize your comments because three minutes goes by very quickly. Following the public comment, the applicant will have five minutes for rebuttal, and then the public hearing will be closed. The only comments which, be, which will be allowed after the public hearing is closed will be in response to any questions from the commissioners. The commissioners will then discuss the case and will make their decision based on the city ordinance, specifically the chap chapter 27 of the city zoning code, the design guidelines, the Secretary of Interior standards, historic preservation development review or HPDRC comments, and the testimony given at the public hearing here tonight. The ARC can only act on items that are within our specific jurisdictional responsibility. Owner agents are independently responsible to obtain any appropriate permits and or approvals. Now if you haven't already done so, please do silence your cell phones and I will ask my fellow commissioners to introduce themselves starting in the middle. I'm Brent Taylor and I'm a general contractor. Good evening, my name is Stephen Sutton. I'm a registered architect. I also hold the architectural historian chair for this commission. My name is Dan Myers. I'm a registered architect. And with us tonight we have Dennis Fernandez, Ron Vila, Elaine Lund, Alexis Guzman, and Dana Crosby Collier, our attorney with the city. And we will now move to the reading of the minutes. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> um, we have the minutes from the February 6th, 2023 hearing to review. And if there are no uh, comments or questions, do we have a motion to enter them into the record? I move that the meeting minutes for the Architectural Review Commission public hearing of Monday, February 6, 2023, be accepted to the record as presented. I second the motion. All in favor, please state I indicate so by raising your hand. Aye. 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 Motion carries. Mr. Fernandez. <coughs> Good evening, Commissioners. Dennis Fernandez, Architecture Review and Historic Preservation Manager. Uh, welcome to you and to our applicants and the public for this evening's public hearing. Uh, we do have a fairly full agenda, so I'll be brief. I have the ARC staff approvals for February of this year to enter into the record. I'll provide those to the clerk for you. Uh, additionally, I did want to bring to your attention on the, on the agendas from this point forward under item number 10 for this month. We'll have a, a reminder for you to make a motion to receive and file uh, any submitted documents and exhibits uh, provided throughout the hearing, uh, unless otherwise instructed by your legal counsel, you, that would avoid you making incremental motions to receive and file through the uh, hearing. And with that, I will turn it over to um, our legal counsel for the disclosure of ex parte communication and conflicts of interest. Good evening, Commissioners. Dana Crosby Collier from the City Attorney's Office. Um, this evening, I needed to inquire of the members if any member has a conflict of interest with any item on the agenda tonight. I have none. 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 Okay, thank you. And has any member engaged in any ex parte communication relating to any item on the agenda this evening? I no. Have none. No. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, moving on through the agenda, we do not have any uh, continuations to act upon this evening. Uh, this is going to be the uh, only hearing for the month of March. We will not be meeting uh, on Wednesday, March the 8th. Uh, it will, is not necessary for our application cycle this month. Uh, with that, we will administer the swear-in. 
anyone in the public who's going to be providing testimony or public input, please stand and raise your right hand, including staff. I did. And with that, we are ready for our first case this evening. Good evening, Commissioners. Elaine Lund, Historic Preservation Staff. The first item before you tonight um, is case number ARC 22-476-TA-CPA 22-23. Um, this is a comprehensive plan amendment recommendation for your review. This is for the property located at 2315, 2307, 2303, and 2301 North Florida Avenue, 2404 and 2406 East Amelia Avenue, sorry, 204, 206 East Amelia Avenue, 205, 207, and 209 East Columbus Drive in the Tampa Heights Historic District. Um, there are, there are several addresses on this site, however, many of them are vacant parcels. Um, there is one structure at 209 East Columbus Drive, which is a circa 1956 non-contributing structure. And then at 2315 North Florida Avenue and 2307 North Florida Avenue, there are two contributing structures to the historic district. And those are on the corner of um, Columbus Drive and Florida Avenue. If you um, move to the photo presentation, you can see where this area is. It's the area um, shown in green on the map of the Tampa Heights Historic District on the, uh, the west end of the district. <coughs> Looking at the 1920s Sanborn map, um, you can see that there were several properties along the Florida Avenue corridor built out of brick and concrete. Um, and additionally, um, several wood frame structures as well. But the brick and concrete structures were primarily the um, commercial structures along that corridor at, this, at that time. They were mostly one and two story buildings. Uh, you notice that just to the east of the subject site are um, were some residential dwelling units. Um, the majority of the area east of the subject site is residential in nature. And you also see the proximity of what was then called the Michigan Avenue Grammar School um, along Michigan Avenue, which is presently known as Columbus Drive. This is the present day aerial of the site, the corner of Florida Avenue and Columbus Drive. And then zoomed in a little bit, these are the individual parcels that compose that site. You see the two contributing, uh, the two parcels with the contributing structures at that corner there at the southeast corner of Florida and Columbus. And then a non-contributing structure on the, uh, the eastern edge of the site. This is 2315 North Florida Avenue, so we're facing northeast in this shot. and 2307 North Florida Avenue facing east. And this is the south side of 2307 North Florida Avenue. And the rear of 2307 and <coughs> 2315 Florida Avenue. And then again, the rear of 2315 North Florida Avenue and its north side. Moving back to Florida Avenue, this is 2303 North Florida Avenue. We're facing east here and facing east again at 2301 North Florida Avenue. Moving around the property, um, this is the view looking into the site from Emilia, Emilia Avenue at 204 East Emilia Avenue and then at 206 East Emilia Avenue facing north. Moving to the Columbus Drive side of the property, and this is looking at the non-contributing um, building facing south from Columbus. Moving a little bit to the west there, this is 207 East Columbus Drive, we're facing south. And then 205 East Columbus Drive facing south. 
moving back to Florida Avenue, and here we are facing north um, at the intersection of Columbus Drive and Florida Avenue. And I'm facing south on Florida Avenue with the um, downtown Tampa in the distance. Turning around and looking across Florida Avenue facing west, this is the view. And then this is the view looking sort of northwest from about that same position. This is a view of one of the contributing structures in the area at the um, sort of catty corner on the northwest side of Florida Avenue and Columbus Drive. A view looking west along Columbus Drive, so you see the subject properties to your left. And then looking east along Columbus Drive, you can see, um, looking into the historic district in here, you can make out the um, Tampa Heights Elementary School there on the right side. Looking across Columbus Drive, we're facing north. And still facing north here as the, uh, the property is on the north side of the subject site. And then moving south back to Amelia Avenue, we're facing east here, looking into the historic district. And then looking west toward the intersection with Florida Avenue. And then facing south from the subject site, this is looking across Amelia, Amelia Avenue. <coughs> and still um, looking south across Amelia Avenue. There's an alley in the middle of the site. Um, Behind, running behind the contributing historic structures. Here we are in the alley facing north. So we're looking towards Columbus Drive here and then turning and facing south. Um, a portion of this alley has already been vacated and here we are looking um, south while in the alley toward Amelia Avenue. And that concludes the photo represent, um, presentation. So at this time I'll ask the applicant's agent to come forward and present the request. Um, good evening, Commissioners. Alex Shaler, 400 North Ashley Drive, for the record. I'm here on behalf of the applicant um, with a comprehensive plan map amendment um, in the uh, Tampa Heights Historic District. Elaine set this up really well with the aerials in the, in the photo. So just you know, to reaffirm, we're at the southeast corner of Florida and Columbus. As you can see, our parcels there are outlined in pink. And then the historic district boundary is shown um, in that yellow dotted line there. So our specific request tonight, or this is our request for um, this filed comprehensive plan amendment. Um, as you can see, currently at CC35 and R20 are the land use designations on the site. We are proposing to change that to UMU60 along the major uh, roadway frontages of Florida and Columbus, and then CMU35 along Amelia, which transitions nicely into that R20 to the east, and the rest of um, the residential in that uh, current neighborhood. In terms of numbers, um, CC35 and CMU35 is a 1.0 FAR for a baseline, can bonus up to a two. UMU60 is um, the next mixed use land use category just above CMU and CC35, um, just one step above. That's a 2.5 base FAR and a 3.25 with bonus. We believe there's inherent justification for this request and the Planning Commission did as well and I'll note that in a little bit um, on a different slide, but the first point that I wanted to make is that this assemblage is located um, directly off of Columbus Drive, which is noted in the comprehensive plan to be a transit emphasis corridor. Um, the comprehensive plan defines a transit emphasis corridor as a corridor that is not only suitable for redevelopment, but also for intensification. Um, beyond that, the site also fronts an arterial roadway um, in the city, which is North Florida Avenue. And Florida Ave is um, the subject of a potential um, extension of the streetcar as well. And so lots of, lots of transit um, surrounding this specific assemblage. The next point I wanted to highlight is that this site is entirely within the Tampa Heights Urban Village. Again, the comprehensive plan, or comprehensive plan similar to the Transit Emphasis Corridor um, has a host of policies that um, support directing growth to the urban villages within the city. As you can see, that's, that's the most notable one there, directing the greatest share of growth to the urban centers and the villages. The Planning Commission heard this request and unanimously voted to um, recommend it for approval. That was back in November of 2022, so the end of last year. And I wanted to pause here um, as I move forward and, and kind of tailor this more, you know, to your specific um, recommendation tonight and, and just state that, you know, 
the Planning Commission is a, is a reviewing body that provides a recommendation. The ARC, you all do the same review and provide a recommendation. Um, we feel that there are many historic district safeguards beyond just a future land use change that you will have the opportunity to review this project again. So again tonight, all we're requesting is a recommendation for a land use change. There's three different processes as this development would continue, um, which would render your feedback. And the first would be whenever there is a proposed specific development on the site, it will come back before you um, as we are tonight with a proposed development intent. That is where you'll be able to recommend um, the actual rezoning and the specific development, um, as you'll see on the site plan, and control things like setback and massing and stuff like that. Um, also, there has to be the approval of a COA for any kind of proposed demolition to take place on the site. Same thing with any proposed development. Um, they would need a COA for um, those specific designs with the facade, um, kind of undulations and stuff, stuff like that that you all um, are more often um, recommending on. So um, again, the, you know, the powers and the duties that say, and we understand that, that you know, your review is to preserve historical integrity and the appearance. Um, again, a change in the future land use has no effect on the historical integrity of the site um, or the appearance of the site state today. Again, it's, it's just namely a change to the actual designation um, in terms of land use on the site. Um, and I'd like to bring up Philip Smith as well. This is the end of my presentation to say a couple words. He's the developer um, and is local to this area and I think he'd like to share a few words with you all. Thank you, Alex. My name is Philip Smith, 1211 Northwest Shore Boulevard in Tampa. I'm the president of Framework Group. We are housing developers based here in Tampa. Uh, we have about 10 developments we've completed here and, and currently uh, 2,000 units or so under development and construction around the state, principally in the I-4 corridor. But I wanted to introduce myself as a developer to this project tonight to tell you um, just generally our posture uh, about our intent to work with you um, on this development. We know very well the, the strains that are put on cities. I'm a Tampanian, so on our city in particular, um, and that come, that come with growth, that come with the, this amazing place that we've all created together. And that tension um, is something that uh, the folks on this board have to resolve because we have valuable things already in place. Um, I want you to know that um, I'm educated as an architect, my degrees are in architecture, so I come to this discussion very, with great empathy for what it is you're trying to do and your mission here, and a great sensitivity to creating buildings that fit. So it will be our intent to try to find ways to strike that balance between the growth that is inevitable and that should and does belong in corridors like Florida Avenue. This commercial corridor is not going anywhere. Um, it is only going to get more dense and that's appropriate because that's how we grow in smart ways. Um, putting people where transit exists, where infrastructure exists, where they can get close to where their jobs and favorite restaurants are. Um, stylistically, there's much to learn from what's around here, um, and we look forward to pulling what's valuable out of this and, and, and making it a historic building that our future residents will know us for. So thank you again. I look forward to working with all of you. Um, some of you have we worked uh, with in the past and, and have had a good relationship and experience, and, and I'm sure it will be the same here as well. So thank you very much. concludes our presentation. We're available for any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and we still go through the staff report, correct? Yeah. Um, before I give the um, staff report for the Architecture Review Commission staff, um, we have representatives here from the Planning Commission and the City's Planning Department, and I would like to invite them to come forward at this time to um, give a presentation and a review of the request is seen from their view. Hello. Hi, Emily Phelan, Planning Commission staff. Um, we have a presentation. Um, no, it's on its way. Oh, okay. Um, so um, it's a privately initiated amendment, as has been stated. It's 1.97 acres in size, and the request is to amend the future land use categories for from community commercial 35 to and residential 35 to urban mixed use 60 along the corridors, and then community mixed use 35 as well. 
And this is just the general location map. As been stated, it's within the in urban village and also within the Sample Heights um, neighborhood as well. And just the general location and the city staff did a good job with the photos, so we have photos as well. This is facing um, north from Amelia Avenue and north along Florida Avenue, east of the subject site from North Florida Avenue. This is the single family detached homes that are to the east of the subject site along North Morgan Avenue. And this is the proposed uh, this is the adopted future land use map. You can see the community commercial 35 that is along the corridors of North Florida Avenue and Columbus Drive and the residential 35 um, to the south side of the site along the Amelia Avenue. The proposed future land use map, the colors are hard to distinguish, but along the corridors of North Florida and Columbus is the UMU 60 designation and on the south side along Amelia Avenue is the CMU 35 designation. Currently, this site, this is what the site would be allowed on the right. On the left is the 46 dwelling units is what it could possibly have, as well as slightly over 114,000 square feet of non-residential or residential uses. With the changes of the future land use categories on the right is the potential where it could have up to 228 dwelling units and over 186,000 square feet of residential or non-residential uses. And with the change of the future land use, it would expand opportunities for the commercial general and commercial intensive uses on the entire subject site. Um, we send this out for agency review and the city of staff had an objection. And planning commission staff found it consistent with policies regarding the development of mixed use areas in all districts that can accommodate local serving commercial employment and entertainment uses, increased density to support walking and transit uses within proximity to employment and transit to further the compact city strategy form. And um, the Comprehensive plan seeks to direct the greatest show, share of growth to the urban villages, and we also found it consistent with future commercial or mixed use development will be required to meet the land development code and associated comprehensive plan policies at the time of review, an additional level of scrutiny due to the Tampa Heights Local Historic District. And the Planning Commission recommended that the proposed amendment be found consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the Tampa Comprehensive Plan. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you. We have um, with us a representative from our city's planning department, Stephen Benson. Good evening, Go Stephen Benson, Director of City Planning. Uh, I did just want to elaborate a little bit on our analysis in looking at this comprehensive plan amendment uh, and clarify uh, the objection that city staff uh, issued for, for the amendment. Um, the comprehensive plan amendment was specifically looking at the consistency of the amendment with the existing future land use map and the existing policies in the plan. It was not specific to the historic uh, designation or the historic preservation guidelines that exist for this area. The uh, Objection that uh, that staff produced was primarily related to the introduction of the additional commercial intensive uses, uh, which would uh, be now permitted under the future land use. However, to actually build and, and introduce those uses, a rezoning would be required. So it would come back before you, it would come back before city council in the form of a rezoning uh, and could be dealt with at that time. The uh, other question that came up was the introduction of the additional density and the additional FAR at this site. You could see that the, the location uh, was unique relative to the land uses around it. Um, in looking at similar plan amendments that have recently been approved, uh, going to the UMU 60 designation, there uh, were a number of amendments throughout the city. Uh, specifically, I can uh, cite a couple in the Ybor City area that did use the UMU 60 uh, within the historic context. So. While we did have an objection based upon uh, the introduction of the additional uses, we do think that that land use category is compatible 
um, because of the nature of Florida Avenue being a transit emphasis corridor and a corridor that's been identified specifically for bus rapid transit uh, in the future. And I'm happy to answer any questions about our review uh, and thank you for your uh, consideration. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Elaine Lund with Historic Preservation Staff. Um, the Historic Preservation Staff found this applicant to be not consistent with the City of Tampa Code of Ordinance in accordance with Section 27113A2J. Um, this is an area that is along the um, along the edge of the Tampa Heights Historic District. Um, however, development allowed under these proposed future land uses would have the potential to be out of character with the scale, massing, and building form, setback orientation, and site coverage, and alignment, rhythm, and spacing of the historic development of Tampa Heights. There are uh, two contributing structures on the site that should be maintained, and any future development on the site should be historically referenced from within the district, both in height and building placement. Um, as such a higher density, since the project is on the edge of the district, a higher density than what you would find within it may be appropriate, um, but the final project should respect the contributing structures on the site in the residential neighborhood to the east. So our staff recommendation is um, for a change in the future land use, but to a less intense category than the uh, proposed UMU 60 category, which is the, the urban mixed use um, 60 category. And with that, I'm available if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lund. So um, we're going to go ahead and open the hearing to public comment. If there's anyone here who would like to speak for or against the recommendation uh, before us here tonight, you may do so at this time. And again, you have three minutes. Seeing no one, we'll go ahead and move on to commissioners asking questions. And we will ask questions of both the applicant and city staff as appropriate. Mr. Myers, any questions? this time uh, just to get started Elaine um, can you tell me which of the buildings are are contributing I'm sorry I didn't get the numbers down so is it the red building yes the the building that's red and the one directly south of it so that's 2315 North Florida and 2307 North Florida so Avenue. so the white one is the white one is is contributing as well yes correct ah okay thank you Any other questions? At this um, time? Not at this time. Thank you. Mr. Sutton. I have no question at this moment. I reserve the right to continue at another time. Mr. Taylor. I have the same stance. <laughs> okay. Um, I do have a question, and it's for the staff member, uh, not with the city. Uh, I'm sorry, the young lady that came up first. I forgot your name. I usually write it down, but I was listening to what you were saying. <laughs> um, if we could go to back to her presentation, there was a slide where you were uh, delineating the differences between the land uses, both the, the adopted and the proposed. And it was a chart. Um, it compared the maximum dwelling and the FARs uh, this one here, I guess it wasn't really a chart. Um, so there's an inconsistency from what I'm seeing in your presentation to what we were given in our packages, and it's it's a pretty big inconsistency. It's the difference between the dwelling unit allowances, um, and I, I when I was reading this before, I thought this was not such a, a a big difference in terms of the number of dwelling units that were possible in the proposed versus the adopted for the um, CC35 to the UM60. But here on this on this slide, it says it has the potential for over 228 dwelling units in the proposed. And in our packet, there's no more than 49 or 79 stated in either of the scenarios that we had been given, presented. Um, so 
how do we get to this number of 228 possible dwelling units in the potential future land use change? Is that through a calculation bonus or? The square footage is, is consistent with what we were given in our packets, but it's the dwelling unit count that's different. It's by 10% 10, 10 or yeah, 10 times, not 10%. Stephen Benson, where was the 70? You said uh, roughly 70 units? So it's, it's in this part of the packet that's with oh. the, the Planning Commission, and it's the second page, the flip side. So it's the one from CC35 to UMU60. It says maximum residential, maximum of 46 under the adopted future, and then a maximum of 79 under the proposed future land use. Um, can you see the proposed future land use map? Yes. Okay. So that chart, the the one that's CC35 to Urban Mix 260, that chart applies to these parcels that are changing, right. that would be changing to UMU60. Um, the total number is for the entire request. And so it would combine the parcels that are changing to UMU 60 and the ones to CMU 35. But those together in the chart, the maximum numbers, don't compute to 228 dwelling units. One says 79 and the other one says 22. That's 111, I believe, if, if I'm doing the calculation in my head correctly. 101, 111. Mm -hmm. There's another one underneath it. Right, oh, I didn't see that one. No, it's the building on it. I didn't notice that third one. It's closer. So, uh, Danny Collins. It's, oh. I'm sorry, is the third, the one under uh, figure to figure three table, is that actually all the parcels together? Because that says 101 dwelling and it says community CC 35 and residential 35 and then proposed UMU 60 and CMU 35. I'm just trying to understand the data you're giving us and how it all comes together. This is uh, Danny Collins with your yeah. planning commission staff. I can chime in here. Um, so the numbers um, on the slide are incorrect. Um, I would go off of the numbers on that are included in your packet. Okay. So, so if you look at um, Figure Three, that is the combined the combined change of change in the CC from the Community Commercial Thirty Five and the Residential Thirty Five to the Urban Mixed Use Sixty and the Community Mixed Use Thirty Five designation. Okay, so one hundred and one dwelling units is the total max. Correct. I'm sorry about the. Okay. Slide, so. All right. Thank you. Um, so I have a further question. I don't know who would answer this. It could be. It could be the agent. Is is any of the proposed changes for future land use? Does that have any? Um, does that have any impact on the potential height of anything, or is that just under the zoning changes when we get to that component of the project? Should we get there? Emily Phelan, Planning Commission staff, that would be at the rezoning stage. Okay, all right. Those are my questions. Any other questions? This is the only time we get to ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Perhaps. Um, gentleman in the green suit who you were with the uh, building building department who, who, who are you Sorry, you're planning city planning city planning okay um, so this seems to be like a very substantial increase 
And um, I'm wondering what the, and our own staff has, has recommended a, that a change is certainly possible, but to a lesser category. And you are also of that, of that mind? We, we did not recommend a lesser category from the perspective of all of the policies and all of the uh, provisions in the comprehensive plan, which historic preservation is a, is a part of it, but it's much broader than that. So our review is a lot broader. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would just offer maybe that looking at it solely through the historic preservation lens, perhaps a different conclusion could be reached. Okay. Relate, I, related to that, sir, and I would like to be able to pass this information, uh, this question on to the applicant as well. Um, is there a, what is the working logic for going into the area of a change in the comprehensive plan for the city of Tampa respecting the development of this combined parcel as opposed to what we more would normally would see here would be a plan unit development. So just, I'm gonna start and, and perhaps uh, one of my planning commission colleagues could speak to maybe the whole, um, the review process for plan amendments, but this would be just the first step. So this project most likely would come back to you as a plan development with site plans, which with actual information to, to visual information to look at. The approval that is being requested is solely to address three things. It's the uses on the site, to expand the potential uses that, that may be asked for at a rezoning, to expand the amount of floor area that may be asked for at a rezoning, and then to expand the allowable density that could be asked for at a rezoning. That's why those are the three pieces of information in the chart that's, that's being shown. Um, that is what is, is being considered with the plan amendment. Uh, the rezoning would then come once that plan amendment's been approved, and the rezoning would have to be consistent with the new plan category ca or categories, since there's multiple categories for this specific site. Could you? I'm, I'm sorry. Could you repeat those three items? It's the FAR, the density, and the, and the the range of allowable uses. Ah, yes. Um, and you, you know, just to be clear, there, the existing zoning does not allow for for any of those things. So they would have to come and rezone but it would be up to the applicant to determine if they would want to rezone to a Euclidean district or rezone to a PD. And then I, I believe you would see it at that point, and then you would also see it again at, 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 uh, at per, uh, for the certificate. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to chime in. Um, this is a change to the future land use. This is not a, a, a zoning request. So this is just a straight land use change. So you're, you're looking at the existing land uses and the densities and intensities, so the density in the FAR, and then what is being proposed under the new land, uh, land use. Um, as Stephen mentioned, any um, zoning would need to be consistent with the future land uses. So um, you're saying that currently that um, they would need to come in for a rezoning to develop the site. So you will see it again um, later on if it does come in through a rezoning. This is just you're looking at the land uses um, of the site. So it's a long range plan for the area. Thank you. So that actually, and I don't know who's gonna answer this, that that would, it would be hugely beneficial, I think, to those of us who are up here and those in the audience who don't do this in their everyday job, to understand the difference between the CMU land use and the um, urban mixed use. What, <coughs> what kinds of uses are actually allowed, right? Because um, currently, under the, the current adopted, meaning it's whatever developments would happen without this change, they would come under the CC35 and the R35 on these particular parcels, right? So what under the urban mixed use can they do that they cannot do under the CC35 and then for the community mixed use, what uses can they do that they cannot do with the R35? Sure, so um, starting with the CC35, um, anything from multifamily, uh, commercial general, commercial intensive uses, um, same. those uses are the same as the UMU60 designation. So the UMU60 allows the same uses as the uh, CC35. The CMU35 allows um, 
The only use it doesn't allow, other than those two, um, those two um, flu categories, is the commercial intensive uses. So currently, or currently, the portions of the site in CMU 35 cannot be considered for um, commercial intensive uses. Um, the residential 35 designation is a residential category. Um, so commercial general uses, commercial intensive uses cannot be considered in uh, the residential 35 designation. Um, all three mixed use categories allow the developer or the, the project can be, can uh, either use um, floor area ratio or density. Um, under the residential 35 designation, residential development can only be used um, using the density, um, density as the, um, using density, they can't use FAR for residential development. So can you give us a definition and or an example of the intensive commercial use in comparison to what can be used today? Um, I could turn that over to Steve and he can kind of go over the types of uses. Yeah, just to, I think I understand what, what you're trying to get at. So the there is not a higher plan category that doesn't introduce the commercial intensive uses. And by higher, I mean more intense and more dense. And I think the bulk of the, re the intent behind the request is really to achieve the additional units and the additional floor area on the site than what would not currently be allowed. So th there is no other option to get the additional density intensity besides this. This is the, only, this is the next bump up, really, in, in the way that the categories are structured. Um, I think it might, it might be helpful to hear from the applicant, too, about their intent, but we, just, we only look at the categories specifically. Can I make a request about um, the FAR is the floor area ratio. Yes, sir. And under the under the uh, the new or the proposed designation, um, they could basically cover the entire site, three floors. Is that? I mean, it's a three point two five. Am I getting that right? So it, they could they could cover it three times. Not not the entire site. I believe if we can go maybe to the map. And this is difficult to see, and Danny may want to also chime in here too, but um, the colors are very similar. I know the map, it looks like they're the same color, but the urban mixed use 60 is for the portions that are fronting Florida and Columbus, and the community mixed use 35 is for the portion that's uh, essentially east of the alley and then south of the parcels that are fronting Columbus. And I, I know the shades are very similar, but they're two different uses. So the answer would be no, it would be uh, the, uh, the Re reaching a 3.25 would just be for the parcels along Florida and Columbus, both mm -hmm. sides, and then um, community mixed use 35 is a 2.0. Ah, okay. Yeah. That, that was also incorrect in this chart that we have. I'd like to follow through, please, uh, for our education. Uh, we have a number of figures in the packet that was given to us. Uh, one is figure number three. It is titled City of Tampa Existing Land Use. And I'd like to have some comparison made, if you would please, to figure number four, which is titled City of Tampa Adopted 2040 Future Land Use. Among many other things, can you tell us um, what is enforced now and what will be enforced in the near future. Because I do understand that the proposed, uh, not the proposed, but the adopted land, uh, 2040 future land use is tailored for uh, the redevelopment of high traffic corridor area, uh, pathways as, as they're being planned throughout the city. So that can make some sense now. But is, the, is that uh, figure four in effect now. So the existing land use and the future land use are not based upon the same types of categories and they carry different, um, they're, they're different from a, from a legal perspective. The future land use is similar to zoning. It's a separate layer mm -hmm. that establishes categories with the three items that I mentioned that's required by state law to be part of the comprehensive plan. The existing land use is the description of how the site is currently being used. Correct. So it isn't, um, uh, it, it, it also reflects what might be non-conforming on the map as well, whereas the future land use map is, is what's currently adopted. Um, so I can, I can provide you with the comparison between the existing 
the, the current future land use, the adopted future land use, mm -hmm. and then the proposed future land use, but not necessarily the existing land uses because there are probably hundreds of existing land uses that would comprise the existing land use map. Being the mixed use area that it is. I can, yeah, we can explain that what the difference would be. And so for, um, for the adopted future land use under CC35, the, and, and this is based upon the, the zoning districts that are permitted in this category. That's what we compare is the underlying zoning under the current future land use, the, the adopted future land use, and then the zoning districts that are allowed under the proposed future land use, because there's multiple layers and the zoning has to be consistent with the comprehensive plan future land use map. And I apologize for being so long-winded, but um, we're trying to not kind of drag it all out. But so right now, the zoning districts that, first, first of all, the zoning that is permitted on, that is currently on the site is CC35, commercial, or uh, yeah, a CC35, and I'm sorry, commercial intensive is already existing on the site mm -hmm. on the parcels that are fronting Columbus and Florida, and then residential multifamily 24 is what's in the back <laughs> where the neighborhood, you know, where it abuts the neighborhood. The zoning districts that are allowed in the current future land use, the adopted future land use, is all of the residential single family districts, all of the residential multifamily districts, residential office, office professional, neighborhood commercial, commercial general, commercial intensive, uh, and then plan development and plan development alternative. For the R35 portion, so back where the neighbor, in the back where the, the neighborhood abuts, for those parcels, uh, again, residential single family, residential uh, multifamily up to the residential multifamily 24 category. So not all the way up to R83, which is I think pres uh, present on the southern end of the historic district down once you get to more towards downtown. You can't quite get there based upon what the, what the land use is in this section of the historic district right now. Um, for what's being proposed, there is, not, there is not a huge amount of difference between what's being proposed. It's just more intense and more dense zoning districts that what you'd be able to access under the adopted future land use. Uh, and so for the, uh, for the proposal, it allows the same use, the same, the, the same zoning districts as UMU 60, uh, uh, the, uh, UMU 60 and CC 35 would allow the same zoning districts with the addition of RM 35, RM 50, so some of the higher multifamily districts, as well as, um, uh, let's see, commercial intensive. So you would get some of the higher multifamily districts, but the commercial intensive uses, which would be things like, you know, potentially auto repair lots or uh, dry cleaners. Like it's, it's those more intensive commercial uses that you wouldn't necessarily find in the middle of a neighborhood. Um, that, that's what would be introduced with the commercial intensive. But again, with the current zoning, those uses cannot be introduced. You have to go back to rezoning to even introduce those uses, which you would see again at the PD stage. That's why we can't really provide, I think, as much detail as you would like now because we don't know what the actual project is that's being proposed. All we have are what's allowed under the future land use map. Thank you very much. Thank you. So is there a way to, from this map, or maybe pull this map out a little bit and show us the zonings in the immediate, or not should say zonings, but land use around the immediate area a little further out than what we are seeing in this presentation? Sure, uh, Danny Collins with your Planning Commission staff. Um, fortunately, this is the only, we can't zoom it out too far, um, but I can kind of go over the surrounding area with you. Um, so this right here on your map uh, is the community, community commercial 35 designation. Um, so uh, development up to 35 dwellings an acre, up to a 2.0 FAR, commercial general, um, commercial intensive uses, as well as multifamily uses. Um, so that um, community commercial 35 is uh, predominantly found along North Florida Avenue, directly north of the site, um, and also north of the site on Columbus. Um, this uh, tan oranges color is, uh, is a residential 10 future land use designation. So that allows um, single family development, uh, residential development up to 10 dwelling units per acre. Um, and it allows to um, allows detached single family uses as well as the consideration of limited townhomes and uh, single family attached. Um, this uh, brownish color and is uh, is uh, residential 35. So it's a medium density residential uh, land use category allows uh, 
multi or residential development up to 35 uh, dwelling units an acre, um, lots of considerations of single family uses as well as multi family uses. Um, this, uh, and I apologize, I'm really bad with colors. Uh, this area, um, this said brown, that's all. This area over here is uh, residential 20. It allows um, single family uh, residential as well as multi family up to 20 dwelling units an acre. And then um, this area over here on East Columbus um, is community mixed use 35. And that's, um, um, again, that allows um, development up to 35 dwelling units an acre, up to a 2.0 FAR, multi family, commercial general, um, as well as single family uses um, on the site. And I think that covers everything in this map. And I just want to add the the UMU 60, since that's the most, I guess we'll call it rare use that you don't see in this area, the nearest locations to the south would be uh, just south of Palm Avenue. There was a plan amendment in that area that I think uh, might have come before you that involved uh, an increase up to UMU 60. And there also was a plan amendment in the Nuccio Parkway area of, uh, of Ybor City, which should not come before you, but is another, it's, it's the, the nearest maybe to the southeast. Um, and then I'm not aware of anything in the immediate vicinity. Uh, the, the other uh, area that was specifically planned for UMU 60 and has uh, uh, a lot of it, a continuous amount of UMU 60, would be the Kennedy Boulevard corridor from downtown to West Shore. All of that is the urban mixed use 60 designation. So if you're familiar with the type of development and the scale of development in those areas or what's being proposed in those areas, that's what um, would be comparable, would be permitted, that intensity and that density in this location. So how many blocks are we talking from this location to those nearest locations? You know, yeah. Yeah, Kimmy Kishner's Tyler Hudson, 400 North Ashley Drive, immediately two blocks to the west of the site, which is, that's the southwest corner of Columbus and Tampa. It's currently the Gold Ring Cafe. That entire block was approved by Tampa City Council for UMU 60. And that's, this is at the edge of the historic district, what's before you this evening. That is not in the historic district, uh, but that is proximate. It's, it's the site you have here. If you're, if you're sort of looking up um, from the sky and up is north, you have the block that we're talking about today. You have the Joe Haskins family dollar block in the middle, which will absolutely come before you at some point for some type of densification. And then you have that gold ring uh, big billboard block to the west that has already been approved for for UMU 60. Thank you. Any other questions? I have no further question. No further um, question. I think we have someone from transportation here tonight for another case, Marty. Is there any insight you can give to us to the transportation plans for Columbus at this location? I think we're very familiar with the intent for Florida, but the idea of Columbus and its intended improvements. I didn't review this for transportation. That okay. was Jonathan Scott. So okay. I'm not that familiar with that. All right. Thank you. Mr. You, do you have any information about that? Tyler Hudson, for the record, um, this little section of Columbus is a little bit challenging because portions of it are actually owned by the county. Um, but there are some some capital improvement projects. I mean, the, the city has, I can't speak exactly to the funding and the timing, um, but I think Columbus is intended for some some roadway improvements. Do you, do you know the specific plans for this portion of Columbus? Because no, I can I tell you up to Florida. Tampa what I know, mm -hmm. that there is a safe streets component and it's actually starting over by coming Howard. in from the west. Yes, mm -hmm. coming over the bridge and coming up to Tampa. And I know how far that goes. I don't understand what's going to the east of that. So, the, so. that's where the, I think the county owns gotcha. it. And, and, but I do know the county has it on their lists. And I think the city, yeah, I'm private sector, but I, right. I think the city and county are working to harmonize that because it's a bit of an oddity how you have you know, county owned and, and maintained roads in the city that connect to the city owned maintained portions of roads in the city right. um, doesn't make a ton of sense. So I think our director of planning might have some insight yeah, here. Sorry about that. That's I, quite all right. Some additional, I wasn't expecting that question, but that's okay. So it, it is owned by the county, so we can't necessarily speak to their CIP, um, but the city did uh, coordinate with the county for the, the resurfacing of Columbus Drive, which has been needed for, for mm -hmm. quite some time. 
and it is on their list of projects that um, will be incorporated into the CIP when additional fun when the next round of funding is is added. Um, the planning for that did already start um, as part of the preliminary work done in anticipation of the surtax that was approved for transportation. So as part of that process, looking at what could be done to improve Columbus Drive when it's going to be resurfaced, there were additional crosswalks proposed and additional lane uh, modifications uh, for pedestrian safety and for bicycle safety for the four-lane section from Howard Avenue uh, to the terminus around North Boulevard and then from North Boulevard East, um, there were going to be additional crosswalks proposed. And I believe that was actually going to go all the way towards the um, towards Central Avenue. Um, but, it, but you're correct, it would end somewhere around this area. Um, I don't know that there were like specific improvements I can speak to like along the frontages of Florida and Columbus, but that would be what's in the immediate vicinity that's been contemplated at this time. And then the other uh, item that was discussed earlier in the presentation, uh, I think it was by the agent first, was that the rapid bus transit option is potentially going to be a component here. Is that along Columbus and or F Florida? The As bus rapid know? transit yes. uh, study um, w uh, w is the, the, the project is currently um, in the, pro it's in the project development phase, so it's still sort of in the planning and design phase. Um, the reason why I spoke about it initially is because in addition to the actual project focused on the infrastructure, um, which was contemplating taking one of the three lanes on Florida and one of the three lanes on Tampa Street and dedicating that as a transit guideway up into Seminole Heights, uh, and then it would shift to a different type of cross-section through Seminole Heights because the one-way pairs don't exist in Seminole Heights. Right. And then it would continue northward um, up to Sulphur Springs and then go from Sulphur Springs, the area around the dog track, up to Fowler and then turn right on Fowler and connect to the University Area Transfer Center. Um, that was the scope of that project. And it, would be, it would be a dedicated lane with stations uh, and there would be a station in the Columbus Drive area. As part of the land use planning work that sort of went along with that, uh, we looked at the station areas for um, major transfers along the route and, and sort of suggested, contemplated what appropriate densities and intensities would be. And they're obviously a lot more intense than what we would probably recommend if that project wasn't in this area. Um, so uh, because those changes and that study has not necessarily come to a final conclusion and come to city council with recommendations. All we have for you is what has been contemplated thus far. Um, it's not necessarily reflecting that on the land use map yet, but um, we are currently working with the planning commission to do um, a more substantive update to the comprehensive plan. And these are one of the areas that we're gonna focus on to actually um, look at map changes. So then when this comes back before you, this may not be the only purple area that you see along Florida Avenue. So was that taken into account by staff contemplating the land use, proposed land use change? It was for the comprehensive plan for, for the analysis that my staff did, but that was why I spoke to sort of at the beginning, the scope of which we review things, it sort of, we try to balance all of the different goals and objectives right. to, to make a recommendation about what's in the best interest for the community overall. And so historic preservation is important. It's one of those pillars, but it's, we have a lot of different pillars to sort of balance and that, that's why we had more of a supportive recommendation um, uh, th than, than your staff did. But nothing set in stone yet? Correct. Okay. Mr. Taylor. So that kind of leads into the next question I had. Um, this looks to be like a pocket land use currently. So my question is, is, is historically, what has been the planning department's stance on pocket parcels like this within the area? We, we, so historically, staff has objected to situations that are on enclave or spot rezonings. That's why there was an objective that was put forward by the zoning staff because it would, it, it triggered that. Um, looking at it solely from a zoning and land use perspective, but if you look at transportation, if you look at, uh, for example, the residential, the, the housing crisis that we're in right now and where it, it makes sense to actually incorporate more housing than maybe we had anticipated for, um, that kind of tips the scales back to uh, this being something that we would we would support. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just have one quick, one more quick question for our historic preservation staff. 
Um, on, under what condition would we allow the demolition of those two commercial buildings? What would that? Uh, the demolition of those two buildings, since they are contributing, they would have to go through the uh, process that's outlined in the city code. Um, with a full presentation regarding the um, condition and the economic um, requirements to build new construction there. Okay, I get, that's good enough. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Scott? None. Okay, you have five minutes for rebuttal then. Thanks, Commissioner. I'll try not to use them all. Tyler Hudson for the record. Um, I think these comprehensive plan amendment recommendation hearings put you on a little bit of a challenging position because you're accustomed to seeing very specific details on proposed buildings. You know, at the beginning of this meeting, it was you know, site plan, elevations. We don't have any of that because this is somewhat theoretical of an exercise. The comprehensive plan, and excuse this metaphor, but I've got a four-year-old daughter who loves Play-Doh. The, the comprehensive plan really gives land the development rights, the amount of, of stuff you can build. It's zoning that implements that. What is the setback? What is the height? What are the uses? How much parking is there? You all get to see that for this property. There will be a PD rezoning file for this that will come before you for recommendation. And you all know how setbacks can be pretty firm in zoning. And so you know how that can inform future decisions about the design. You, that's a recommendation vote like this one is. There will be a certificate of appropriateness that will come before you for what any new building looks like, where you all don't have recommendation authority, you have approval authority. You get to say with great specificity how you want the building to look like. What, what we're asking for here is the opportunity to build a little bit more than you can now. For some reasons that are outside the scope of this specific hearing, this is an exceptionally challenging development site. Um, I live a block and a half from here, lived there for eight years through three kids. Uh, this has had zero interest from the development community uh, really into the last, I'd say, six months. Uh, and my client is not the first person to try to take a run at this. There's some significant challenges. There's a thousand square foot city piece of land that's shaped like a splinter. It sort of functions as a splinter for the development. We've had significant conversations with city real estate about that. It's a challenging site. But we're growing as a city. We need to find places to accommodate greater density. And I can think of few better candidates as a land parcel than this because it's at the intersection of two arterial roads. You have the heart, Route 1 goes through here. That's 15 minute transit service. By Tampa standards, that's phenomenal. That's the best that, that we have. It's very bikeable, it's very walkable, and the city is directing a lot of infrastructure investment with the scarce resources it has to this area. I think, as Alex alluded to, there are a lot of safeguards that you have. There's a lot of power that you commissioners have to determine what ultimately gets built here. You are going to get to weigh in on the mass, on the height, on the uses, on the parking, on the green space, all of that through the zoning. And if we're able to get through that with you and the city council, you're going to have a very good opportunity to go into the detail of the design about what that looks like. What we're asking today is for you to let us come before you with that detail, with that plan. But to do that, we do need some more development rights. We need some. We need the ability to do a little bit more than what you're currently allowed to do. Um, we think it's reasonable. We think the Planning Commission um, likewise found it reasonable with their unanimous vote and, and would ask that you recommend this for approval to City Council this evening. Thanks for your time and your patience. Thank you. All right, we will go ahead and close the public hearing and discuss the case. Thoughts, anyone? Um, this is a very difficult. I think this is one of the more difficult things that we do is figure out what happens on these art on these arterial streets, um, and particularly at the edges of our historic district districts. Um, but through the conversation here, I have developed a. Uh, a fair amount of comfort uh, when the floor area ratio for those for those parcels which face either Columbus or Florida uh, is set at three and then the floor area ratio for the uh, portion that faces along Amelia uh, to the 
east of the uh, alley to set it to, uh, I think that we are, that our approval would, uh, would be uh, acceptable, would be acceptable to, uh, or, or let me, you know, you say that it would be, that it would be uh, in concert with the, uh, with the area itself. It's not out of scale here. Uh, and I think that that's very important. Any other thoughts? I am very much concerned about the potential matter of, uh, if you will, opening up a Pandora's box uh, with respect to this proposed uh, change uh, in the comprehensive plan. As we have to remember here, uh, one, the, uh, the proposed change is even beyond uh, what the city of Tampa is already uh, uh, contemplating uh, for this general area, uh, their adopted 2040 future land use plan. Uh, so, you know, this, this board in the past, uh, our historic preservation uh, uh, efforts in the past haven't been stomped on in, uh, by rezoning issues with the uh, matter of city of Tampa uh, because of the properties are uh, have a zoning characteristic and a plan characteristic which is by far higher in terms of, uh, of the density that we would normally have within the immediate environs of the site in a historic district. Uh, Basically, I see this as even granting more. Now, what this turns into in the future, I don't know. But we have lost zoning battles in the past. That was where my line of question came from, because that's basically my same concern, is you potentially it starts with one again again I you know I'm not trying to look into the future but I was looking at that future land use that is already adopted and now we're looking to change it to meet the requirements of whatever this potential development is um, and the density is quite more it's this quite a bit more than what is currently being able to be used today um, and so when you know that was one of the questions I had was you know, what is the closest area to this that is you're able to have this same sort of land use and it sounds like it's you know at least a couple to a few blocks away it's two blocks to the north um, this is a, a entryway to the historic district uh, from two different directions but it does also fall on a very heavy, heavy traffic count corridor in two different directions. Uh, so I agree, it's, it's a very difficult situation, you know, for us as well as the potential developer um, and the city for that matter, because you do have a parcel here that will sit vacant until someone can figure out how to make use of it. And I don't think a, I don't think that a vacant parcel now someone could come along depending on our decision here and say, "Oh yes, I can do that without having to do it." UV and so we're just going to do this but I think that it that the, the development is being driven by the, the greater densities you know, development uh, and the good of the city really are being driven by these uh, increases in, in density I don't think that the uh, the density is out of line at this point um, and we will, we will be seeing it again. Um, and 
much of the surrounding area is protected by the uh, restrictions of the historic district. And uh, just looking at this, the percentage of it that is, that is covered by those two commercial buildings um, is maybe 25 or 30 percent. Um, and those buildings uh, are, are well, we saw we saw photographs of them. We can we can all make our determinations about those buildings. Um, so again, I'm I am uh, uh, I am in favor of our of our recommending this to the to the city council. So I have reservations. I I am I am in the camp of. I understand certainly where we are as a nation and as a municipality and a region and the struggles everywhere in terms of finding attainable, not just affordable, attainable housing. And understanding that density is important to attain a, a particular uh, point of ROI on investment, right? Um, and how all those things have to come together and work and, and make uh, a development um, function for all the parties involved, cities, counties, private developer, all of that. Um, but I do think it opens up a can of worms to allow a more intensive, dense development. Um, and by changing the adopted to the proposed, which was done by private, it was in initialized by the private sector, not by the city, or any other government um, benefactor. I think there are other properties and parcels within the city f surrounding the urban core that are much more appropriate for the, the denser uh, land uses. I think if we were just talking about um, uh, maybe the CM, the, um, too many papers, so I'm losing track of where I am. Um, the CMU 35, I'd be more um, supportive, but the 60 is just throwing me for a loop. And when I look at the, I, I look at the, the notes that in either scenario, um, the developer or the owner can take either the FAR or the, um, either the density or the FAR as their calculation method um, is concerning because it does allow, depending on the zoning that initially is, um, you know, allowed for each parcel or each component of the, of the property that is held, um, we could be up against uh, heights and other things that would be allowable. And as much as I appreciate Mr. Hudson's comment about as having some power. We have seen very much in the last year our recommendations overturned and changed significantly so that certain developments are moving forward with a higher um, a height uh, that is higher than we had ever hoped for or even sometimes a density that we had hoped for or recommended. So um, I think anything that we can do to sort of keep the historic uh, fabric and nature of community and that means as a village in, in, included in that. Um, I find it interesting you know that we do have these urban villages um, targeted within the comprehensive plan and when I think of the village it's a three to five story uh, really beautiful walkable neighborhood and when I when I start to see the the intensity of this use it's more like what I envision channel side to be and this is not that part of the city. I live here too. I've lived here for 28 years in the same home. I can walk to this part of the city. I can walk to other places in the city and, and I know how um, intense the traffic on Tampa and Florida can be and I can understand the, um, the desire to put denser development along Florida. But I think because we have so very little of the historic fabric along these edges, it is very important that we do um, use them as anchors for the district. So 
I'm really conflicted. You know, on the one hand, I want to I want to support the growth of our city. I want to be able to see projects move forward that might be able to integrate um, options for multiple classes and the socio and economic stress that we have here in the city, but the historic district, especially our, our entryways into the historic district are, are very important, I think, mm -hmm. to holding together some sort of fabric. I agree, I agree very much. Uh, you know, towards that end, I, 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 you know, although the adopted 2040 plan you know, offers uh, uh, in its own right a, a certain degree of, of density greater than, than what we would normally expect, uh, within the heart of, uh, of this district. Um, I do see that as being an appropriate you know, departure point for where you can build a modulated density between what is a high traffic or a high tra uh, density commercial uh, core that surrounds this, this, this pocket and our more intimate core, which is the neighborhood in and itself. To me, asking for more is asking for trouble. Well, if this piece of paper here that we had in our packet is correct, and I know there was some differentiation between what we were presented and what's in this, it's not double, but it's almost double. It's, it's one and a half, yeah. It's almost double. Um, and then on top of that, it's the maximum square footage of non-residential use that can be put on the parcels. So it's the 101 dwelling units plus the 280 plus or minus 1,000 square feet. Which is the number that really sticks out. Right. I think we, have, we may want to open our uh, uh, public hearing again. Uh, and I, I guess I can do that, right? I move that we reopen the public hearing. Can I have a second, please? I'll second. All in favor, please stand and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Four. Please, I think there was someone who wanted to I address apologize. the board. Stephen Benson, I just wanted to, to clarify, it would be either or. So you couldn't double dip and do the maximum FAR and the maximum density. Because okay. They're, because yes. they're mixed use categories, they're meant to address it all as one. So being we have it back open, based on that explanation, I did some numbers a while ago and I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. <coughs> If the average residence was 2,000 square foot, that's 139 units. That's correct. Okay. So in a density, and a, a 2,000 square foot unit, I think we would all probably agree that that's probably a large unit for a development like this. So we could potentially see 220 units, 240 units at, at 1,000 square foot. Um, so again, I just want to get some clarification on this. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions for anyone? Mr. Hernandez? Oh, that's right. So you do have a, another rebuttal opportunity if you need it, Mr. Hudson. Um, Tyler Hudson, for the record, I, I don't think we have any further. I think you guys, okay. it's, it's a tough call. It is. Yeah, it is. Thanks. Thank you. We'll go ahead and we close the public hearing, go back to our discussion. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. So it's, it's either or. Right. But. So I, I do think it's appropriate that there is more density. I mean, we are, we are talking about the opportunity here for the city, for the community at large, and even for the historic district to re enliven an edge, right? It, it is right on the cusp of tipping over and really becoming um, that next jumping point for interest in development. But we have to be really careful. This is not armature works. This is not, this is not channel side. Um, and um, there's a lot more single, single residential components, especially right there by the elementary school. It is much more about that type of community and we have to be careful about how this potentially feeds into other projects that could come back. And we don't know the future, 
that setting that precedent within the historic district is the thing that I really am cautious about. If this wasn't in the historic district, maybe it's a different conversation, but um, just knowing that community, how walkable it can be, given the right opportunities, is gonna be fantastic. Um, it's a tough call. I feel that once, that in order for it to become a walkable community, and to be a walkable community that has the kind of um, commercial uh, opportunities, uh, employment opportunities, it needs a little more density. Density isn't the only thing that makes a community successful for uh, walkable, livable, and economically affordable. Public transportation is a huge component of that, and I will argue any day with any planner anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and that was why I was having the, I was asking the questions I was asking. Is there's, and there's nothing set in stone yet. We've, we've heard, I've lived here for 30 something years. I've right. been hearing the same conversations about light rail, rapid bus, you know, even the bullet train. And we just don't seem to be able to get that through anybody's head that unless we get those components right, doesn't, how, doesn't matter how many units we put in, if we don't put the right units in at the right place, with the right public transportation support, it doesn't work. And a lot of people are left out in the cold, you know. Um, there is a certain chicken and egg right. difficulty about right. pr the provision of public transportation. Correct. Um, and I've had to take public transportation in this city. <laughs> <laughs> I did not have a car until I was 28. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, are we ready to entertain a motion or do we need to discuss anything further? This is a recommendation to the city council. Mm, that is correct. Yep. And we do have to list the whole. The whole properties, yes. I move to recommend city council to deny ARC case ARC 22-476 TA CPA 22-23 for the combined properties of 2301 North Florida Avenue, 2303 North Florida Avenue, 2307 North Florida Avenue, 2315 North Florida Avenue, 204 East Amelia Avenue, 206 East Amelia Avenue, 205 East Columbus Drive, 207 East Columbus Drive, and 209 East Columbus Drive for the proposed rezoning from Land use change. Uh, thank you. For the proposed land use change from R35 and CC35 to CMU35 and UMU60 for the reason that under Chapter 27, 113, a, 2, and J, the applicant has failed to present a proposed change in density that would be significant to the point where the preservation of the historic integrity of the Tampa Heights Historic District may be called into question. I second. In favor, please say aye and raise your hand indicating so. Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries three to one.
Commissioners, the, uh, the next item on this evening's agenda is case ARC 23-119 for the property located at 6102 North Suwannee Avenue in the Seminole Heights Historic District. Um, this property is home to a circa 1928 contributing single family residence. Um, and the request this evening is two part. Um, the first request you will hear is for the variance on the north side yard. And if that variance is approved by this board, you will hear the um, certificate of appropriate request, appropriateness request for new construction of an addition to the primary structure and um, new construction of an accessory structure with site improvements. Uh, moving to the photo presentation, this is the 1920 Sanborn map of the area um, showing the property, uh, subject property in green. It's at the northwest corner of Paris Avenue and um, Suwannee Avenue. You can see the existing house shown there in yellow on the parcel. And there was at one time a um, accessory structure tucked into the, uh, the very corner of the parcel. This is the district map, um, Seminole Heights Historic District, showing the location of the subject site in the uh, northwest corner of the historic district. And this is the present day aerial map showing the um, location of the site at Paris and Suwannee Avenue. This is the front of the existing structure. This is the north side of the building. And this is a view of the south side of the building. Moving um, out a little bit, you get a kind of view of the um, south and east sides of the building there. And then moving around the corner to Paris, this is um, the appearance of the structure from Paris Avenue. This is looking north along Suwannee Avenue. This subject property is to your left. And then looking south um, along Suwannee Avenue across Paris. This is the property located across Suwannee Avenue. And here we are looking east along Paris Avenue across Suwannee. And then looking west toward Florida Avenue along Paris. And then this is the subject site is, um, this is the property just to the south across Paris from the subject site. This is the rear of the subject um, property. It's the um, existing conditions in the, the rear yard. The existing accessory building in the, the rear yard. Just a few more views of that. Um, then we have the alley, uh, which runs north to south behind the subject site. This is looking north in the site, so the commercial structures along Florida are to your left and the subject sites to your right. And then this is in the alley looking south toward Paris. And then this is a view of the commercial property just on the other side of the alley. And that concludes the photo presentation. So at this time, we'll have the applicant present the request. Good evening. Uh, my name is Alan Dobbs with Florida Design Studio. I'm the agent on this project. Uh, my client, uh, Spencer, is here. It's him and his wife uh, own this property. Um, on the projector here, I, this is the site 
And the reason that we're needing to get this, the variance is there's an odd reconfiguration of the property line here. This is the survey, and you can see this portion in yellow is the portion that was cut out. It's approximately three feet at its uh, deepest point there. That modification to the property was done before my uh, clients purchased it. It was actually done by an attorney uh, that owned the property to the north previously. Don't know how it was approved because normally those kind of odd lot reconfigurations are not allowed. But me, regardless, it, it happened. And uh, I'm not sure if my client has been working with his uh, adjacent property owner to see maybe if they could get that back. There's no reason for it. There's no building or structures here, which I'll show you in the site plan uh, um, that goes out a little bit further than this one. But anyway, so you can see where we're adding a two-story addition here. Um, this is a young family and they need room to grow. The existing house is only a 2-2 two -two with approximately 11 Two, two, two bedrooms, two bathrooms, and approximately 1,144 square feet of conditioned space. They basically want to add a master suite and a bedroom, bathroom, a larger living area, and a, a new larger kitchen. That's probably the most popular thing that people do to these older homes in Summer Heights. And previously, people lived in the front of the houses. Now, they live in the back, so these additions um, are always towards the back and creating uh, a larger sort of living space, typically a great room that has a kitchen, dining, and living, which is what uh, we are proposing. Um, also, when you're adding to the back of the house, we're limited on how far we can go back. We do have a rear yard setback, but because of the lot, you know, we want to conserve green space so that we don't go over 50% uh, lot coverage, and we want to uh, keep the addition as compact as possible but in this case it just wasn't possible with the uh, with the programmed activity that we were uh, that we're proposing um, the uh, so I talked about the survey so I'll show you the the site plan I mean excuse me the, the floor plan so that you can see that kind of helps justify why we're um, needing to get this variance. This is the site plan that shows it a little bit further. That, there's the adjacent building. You can see even with the addition, we're more than 22 feet away from the building and we're, in the, we're more than eight feet from the original uh, platted property line. So this space is configured like that because of the floor plan. The, there is a second floor addition, and I'll get to that when we get to the CA portion, but the second floor addition is within the, the original width of the house. But for the uh, space you need for a family room, a dining area, and a kitchen, it's, it's uh, you know, it requires about this much space. We are projecting out a little bit more on this side than this original, but we're still well within side yard setback, and also we wanted to have a side entry here. so. We can't do that within two feet. We had to bump it out a little bit further, and the mass in here is separated. But that sort of uh, speaks to why we're going out that far. Again, if that bump out wasn't there, we would not need this variance. We did move the accessory building further south so that we did not need to get a variance for the accessory building. So um, we did get a couple letters of support. And so. I guess what I'll do is summarize the response to the hardship criteria, and then I'll, that will conclude my uh, variance presentation. Um, the first one is related to the hardships being unique and singular. As I mentioned, the original platted lot 
line was modified in an unconventional manner uh, when the adjacent property to the north was an annexed approximately 80 by three and a half feet of the petitioner's original platted lot. Uh, this created an unconventional jog property line configuration that's typically not allowed and created a hardship for any future development of this property. Per chapter 27, 2711, and, and I'm quoting here, no division or reconfiguration of an existing zoning lot or lot of record may occur that is in a configuration which is patently inconsistent with existing lot development orientation and historical precedent pattern of parcel configuration in the neighborhood. The, the second one is relating to it being a self-created hardship. Well, obviously, this was the way the property was when my clients purchased it. The third one is the variance, will not, if granted, will not substantially interfere or injure the health, safety, and welfare of others. Um, the, as I mentioned, this, this addition is more than 22 feet away from the closest adjacent residential structure on the north property line. And I believe that's one of the people that issued a letter of support of this. The variance is in, in with harmony and serves the general intent and purpose of this chapter and adopted Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Uh, the requested variance is consistent with the general intent and purpose of this chapter and the adopted Tampa Comprehensive Plan by allowing existing single family residents to be modified in a reasonable use and based on the originally platted lot and not be forced to do something less. Allowing the, this is the fifth um, one, allowing the variance will result in substantial justice being done considering both public benefits intended to be secured by this chapter and the additional hardships or practical difficulties that will be suffered due to the failure of the board to grant this variance. Uh, the variance will allow additional living area consistent with surrounding homes in the area. Similar homes of this size in the area do not have the extra burden of a small, oddly configured uh, intrusion into their lot. The variance for a side yard setback reduction would provide relief and allow reasonable use of the property. Um, substantial justice will be done by allowing for the hardships and practical difficulties to be addressed. And then, of course, the last one is relating to um, development being consistent with the design stat, uh, standards and historic patterns of development. My response to that is the proposed addition meets all the requirements of the Seminole Heights design guidelines and Secretary of Interior standards for modification to a contributing structure in a historic district. Scale, massing, setbacks, orientation, site coverage, alignment, rhythm, and spacing are all especially important considerations for a project like this, considering the existing design constraints and the historic patterns of development. Sorry, that was a little wordy, but um, anyway, so that, that will conclude my portion of the, for the variance. Okay, thank you. So, um, in the case of the variance, we do not have staff report. Um, is there anyone who would like to speak for or against the variance request portion of this case here tonight? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the public comment and um, we will begin asking questions. Starting with my left, Mr. Taylor. So this question would actually be for the owner because you've already answered in the presentation. Has there been any communication with your neighbor in regards to purchasing this portion of land that would allow you to have a more typical lot configuration? Before he answers that, he has not been sworn. Okay. So. Um, They're gonna. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Okay. It's my first time. I do. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? So the question is, has there been any communication with the neighbor uh, to purchasing this poor parcel of land that does not look like it you know, has any use to them? No, there has not been with this particular neighbor. Um, she just moved in recently in the last several months, but she's one of the ones that wrote the letter of support. Uh, but as far as purchasing the land, no, it's not been a discussion. Okay. And then my next question will be for you, Mr. Dobbs. Um, 
you showed us the floor plan, which I understand the concept there, but looks like what we're looking for here is about two and a half feet. Was there any configuration with that floor plan making it a little smaller so you did not have to ask for this variant? Well, so, yeah, there's six heart, there's six criteria there that, uh, that the board uses to look at and consider uh, granting variances. The, the, there's certain ideal, you know, sizes of spaces and things like that. Uh, certainly, um, you know, this house is modest size. These rooms are relatively modest. The, we could, if we did shrink this back, it would just make it less functional. But we were, we were, we were figuring since this uh, en encroachment into the air, that's the only reason we're requesting this variance. That you know, um, it seems like it's a reasonable uh, request um, because most of the houses in, in the neighborhood. Sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. Most of the houses in the neighborhood have setbacks of seven feet or so, and they're usually right in that area. So I think by having this building not being able to project out as we show it, it sort of creates um, sort of an inconsistent pattern where the building is actually further from the property line than is typical. This building is already a little bit further over this way as it is, but um, anyway, so that's, that's uh, why we're um, requesting this variance. Thank you. That's all I have for now. I don't have any questions right now. Mr. Sutton? My question has already been addressed. Thank you. Mr. Myers. I just find this to be really odd. And I, um, <clears throat> does the fence follow the new property line or does it follow the old property line? I mean, is it? It appears on the survey that the, um, because I have the survey under, as an underlay there, that it, the fence does follow the, uh, the current property line, not the platted property line. And nobody has any idea how in 2018 this somehow someone latched onto this additional 80 by three foot slice. Yeah, when I first saw it, I thought that's very odd. And then I thought, well, the, the building, they must have had a, a tree there or, um, or they wanted, the house was too close to the property and, and it wasn't any of that. And I tried to track down the previous owner of the property to the north to find out you know, what had happened and trying to find her contact information, I found out that she was an attorney. <laughs> so, so somehow she was probably able to write uh, a modification to the, both properties' deeds that included this portion of the property. But I don't know how it got approved through the city of Tampa, but it might not have ever gone through any kind of approval. It might have just been handled um, through the attorneys, I guess. No further questions. How many square feet is okay. how many square feet is the existing primary structure? The condition area is at eleven hundred and forty four square feet. And how how many square feet is the new addition? The new addition including what we're doing on the second floor, we're adding uh four. No, I I really I just oh. want to understand the, the ground floor plan. So oh, the, the the, the primary structure is a one-story structure. Okay. It's 1,100 square feet. The addition you're putting at you, the same floor level is how many square feet? Okay, so you want to know how much we're adding just to the first floor. Correct. Give me a second because I have a drawing. Sure, back sure here. absolutely. preface um, this area first just by saying that this portion right here 
is going to be uh, removed. But this drawing shows that's the force. That's the, this is what I thought they just showed. So this is how much we're adding right here, excluding the porch. Seven hundred ninety-eight square feet. So what's the total square footage of this home then, as proposed? Just the primary. The the total area under roof will be three thousand sixty-four square feet. Okay, we have one thousand four hundred and thirty-six thousand square feet. I mean, um, yeah, 1,436 1, square feet noted on the, um, our cheat sheet. So it's a much different number. What was that number again? Three. The, and I'm reading it off the drawings that were submitted, and yeah. you're talking about the total area? Yeah. Under roof. Primary, not for addition. The, for the primary? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 3,064 square feet. 64. And that is not including this, the accessory structure, correct? No. Okay. So could you slide that drawing over so we can actually see the table? Oh, yeah. This is, um, these numbers might have been adjusted a little bit, but still need this or you want me to leave it up here? I'm sorry. If okay. the total primary square foot, I'm just trying to get numbers for it in my head. I understand. It's 3,000 square feet plus or minus. Correct. The existing to remain is 1,100 square feet. Approximately, yeah, a little bit more. You said that the the new on the ground floor would be 800, so that means there's another 1,100 on the second well, floor? Well, the, the area that I was talking about, the 3,064, that's gross area. That includes conditioned and unconditioned space. Okay, all right. That might be the difference. Okay. Because you can see yep. on this, there's no that that can help because I think the two porches are probably factored into that three thousand. Yes, yeah, so yeah, you move that table, area. If you'll move that table back over so we can see it again, that's why I asked for that. Oh, okay. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, unconditioned area. Yeah. So there we go. That's what I'm looking for. The first floor. I have no further questions. Anyone else with a question for the agent or the owner at this time? I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Dobbs. Um, so the actual, in order for you not to need to request a variance, you would have to make the combined kitchen, dining, family area 40 square feet smaller. Is that correct? 16 feet wide and t approximately two and a half feet yes, deep. I trust your math. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. You have five minutes for rebuttal. Okay. Would you like to say Thursday? Anything? I don't have to. Okay. Okay. Um, nope. That's okay. All right. Thank you. We'll go ahead and close these, this portion of the uh, public hearing and begin discussion. Anyone like to start? Bring anything up to the forefront? I think Commissioner Myers asked a, asked a very good question. This is his last question. Um, as to actually how much the addition would shrink if the variance was not granted. And is that in terms of a hardship that, that a variance is called for? It was a good question. I agree. I think I, I think it's a shame that's, that that your client has inherited a site with an oddball property line. Um, 
would be wonderful to see if that could ever get uh, resolved. But I see this as being a very substantial and substantive uh, addition. And, uh, and why it could not be planned suitably to fall within the confines of, of the current setbacks uh, required for this site uh, uh, eludes me. Uh, there, I, I see this as an element of being a self-inflicted hardship. Well, that's what I was going to say was I, go, I keep going back to the hardship list. And that's really what we're here and this is what we have to mm -hmm. make our, our ruling on. He may not have created the land line, line, but the addition is being created by their design. Correct. And so I see multiple other scenarios play out here that he still could potentially achieve what he's trying to achieve, whether it be purchase of the land, whether it be reducing the size of the plan. I mean, there's, there's a multitude of things here you can do. Um, so I, I, I heard that the hardship wasn't being created, which again, the land line is not, but the actual addition is. And that's where I keep backing into. It, it is an unfortunate circumstance for sure. Granted this odd lot, but unfortunately he can make he and his family can make several decisions here that would still work within the constraints of what we have here for the site plan. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's not, it's, to me, it's not a big number. I don't think that really is a, an important part factor uh, that uh, to think about how, you, if you want to redesign it for the gentleman, how you could just take a nice little sliver of a slice off this and it fits within the confines of your site limitations. Um, I'm sorry, it's a, it, 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 it doesn't dwell on me as, as a, a kind of a hardship where, let's say, um, uh, the, build, the original building is on in an entirely oddball place within its site, maybe even you know, uh, contravening its, its supposed setbacks. But no. Uh, we just have, I think, uh, a proposal in front of us uh, that just bumps into and just exceeds the existing limitation without going through an exercise of trying to resolve itself in one form or another. I agree. And to add to that, every time we see one of these little things is almost like a little permission flag waving for everyone else in the neighborhood. So there's a consistency item that we're looking at too here. Any other thoughts? Anyone willing to entertain a motion at this time? I move that the variance request for ARC 23-119 for the property located at the uh, 6102 North Swanee yeah. Avenue. Yeah. Um, With a with an encroachment of uh, of two and a half feet, with uh, two feet for eaves and gutters, uh, be denied due to the failure of the petition to meet the burden of proof with regard to the six hardship criteria set forth in section 27-1114D of the City of Tampa Code of Ordinance, specifically that. Um, the hardship is not created by the property, it's created by the design of the addition. I'll second that. Are we good? Okay. Um, all in favor, please state aye and indicate so by raising your hand. Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, based on that motion, uh, the certificate of appropriateness will need to be continued uh, in consultation with the agent. Uh, we do have some room on the April 3rd agenda at 5.30 p.m. Uh, I think that's be the preferred request at this moment for both uh, the garage and the addition to the primary structure. Can we get a motion, please? 
April 3rd. Yes, we yes. have to make a continuance Motion for both continue. the primary and the accessory structure. Mm -hmm. I'll move that uh, the uh, to continue the uh, case of ARC 23-119 for the property located at 6102 well, North. Okay. Move to grant a continuance in the case for the certificate of appropriateness for ARC 23-119 for the property located at 6102 North Suwannee Avenue um, to the April 3rd public hearing at 5.30 p.m. A second, please. I second the motion. All in favor, please state I am raise your hand indicating so. Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Commissioner is moving forward with tonight's public hearing. The agent has requested a five minute recess to get everything in order. We are in recess for five minutes.
Actually, uh, Mr. Yeah. Vila, sir. Good evening, Commissioners. Ron Vila, I'm staff for Historic Preservation. Moving to our next agenda item, which is ARC 23-120 for the address of 2108 West Marjorie Avenue. This is in the Hyde Park Historic District. The underlying zoning is RS-60. Uh, under the RS-60 zoning classification, uh, an accessory structure can be up to 900 square foot as long as it meets the, uh, the uh, setbacks established by zoning. The structure that you're going to see today is at approximately 740 square feet. Uh, along with the certificate of appropriateness for new construction for an accessory structure with site improvements, there are three variances attached to it. We do have John Marsh with transportation to answer any questions uh, when the, that portion comes up. Uh, the variance information hardship is attached to your staff report. It's at the back, so you could follow along. We will deal with the variances first, like we did the uh, prior case. Uh, he has 10 minutes to go through the variance uh, request, and then we will uh, entertain uh, a motion. And then if that passes, we'll go into the certificate of appropriateness. At this time, I'd like to go through the photo presentation. I usually start with the 1929 Sanborn map. Uh, I think it was very important to, to look at the Sanborn map. A portion of this parcel was sold off to the neighbor. As you look at the Sanborn map, you see that the primary structure is shifted over to one side. This would be the west. You see the accessory structures in the back. One is the accessory structure that is delegated to the property in question. The other accessory structure is delegated to the neighbor to the east. And maybe that's why that uh, 14 foot of land has been um, uh, sent over to the neighbor to the east. Uh, that will show up through the photo, uh, through the presentation this evening. Uh, once again, this is uh, on Marjorie. It's on the corner of um, Albany and Howard. There is a usable alley to the rear that tees. This is the front of the primary structure. Looking at the west elevation of the primary structure, so you get an understanding of the vocabulary. Looking at the abutting house that shares a common property line uh, to the west. Then moving down the vehicular access, uh, they, they share a common apron. This is the property in question. You see the situation here and how the uh, flare dog legs to the accessory structure. This is that abutting structure to the east. Just to focus a little bit more onto the property and you see um, some of the dimensions that are there and, and once again, that'll come up through the presentation. This is looking back from the site, back towards the street, which is Marjorie and just further down uh, the site, looking at the uh, two accessory structures. They both seem to be the accessory structures that were shown on the Sanborn map. 
Uh, this one is non-contributing, so it can be removed administratively and um, reconstructed. I took a series of uh, street shots. This is a street that uh, comes off of Howard, which is a commercial corridor. There is no parallel parking along any section from Howard to Albany, so they don't have the ability to park on the street like some of their neighbors within the Hyde Park community um, do. So this is in the other direction. This is looking at the accessory structure and kind of just uh, dissecting the accessory structure and kind of showing why it was deemed non-contributing when they did the windshield survey back in the early 80s. And this is the rear. Uh, it is a usable alley. It's one of the better alleys that we have in Hyde Park. And this is just showing the condition and the surface in both directions. That concludes the photo presentation. We'll dive into the variance portion at this time. So Mr. Dobbs, uh, continue. Good evening. I'm Alan Dobbs with Florida Design Studio. I'm the agent on this project. Uh, my clients recently, has, husband and wife, they recently purchased this property and uh, realized that they needed to address several issues, obviously, relating mostly to vehicular access and vehicular storage which is basically resulting in wanting to build a new accessory structure and also including uh, some second floor uh, living space, which is typical of most of the accessory buildings in Hyde Park. In reviewing the site constraints, the lot size is one of the very big challenges. As you can see on the screen, uh, the original platted lots were all 57 feet, but these lots here, property lines were adjusted and these two lots um, gave up some of their property for them. So 40 is really narrow and then my client's 46. So that's why we have such an issue right here. Um, we do have the alley and so we, you know, we can access it from the alley, but there's certain transportation uh, maneuvering standards that we have to deal with uh, accessing from the alley. But the main thing is, is just pulling in and parking on this side is, is very difficult. As Ron said, there's, there's no street parking and the, uh, the historic pattern of having accessory structure where it should be to maintain historic patterns is certainly a challenge. So there's quite a few accessory buildings in the area. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit. So these are some more detailed shots showing the proximity of the structures. Um, looking towards the front and then looking towards the rear. These are some accessory structures in the area. This basically shows the lot, the size of the lots. Uh, these are some an annotated pictures that show, uh, like for example, where the fireplace is. Uh, this is cracked because of, you know, having to drive on it, get, trying to get squeeze a car in between these two. You can see how close the mirrors are there on you can see how close the houses are in the chimney line to the property line and then as ron mentioned um, there's no parking no street parking on marjorie so all those things kind of contribute to uh, just having difficulties parking these are some of the accessory structures you can see many of them are very close to the alley there's another one sometimes they park sideways parallel to the alley. Uh, this is a single car one. It's, it's able to step back a little bit further, which we're not able to do, which I'll show you in the site plan. Again, this is not a, a vehicular entrance, but it does look like it was designed to be a vehicular entrance, but you can see uh, roughly how far it set back from the property line. And then this one, two-story structure, that's very close right there. <laughs> These are some more, de some detailed pictures of, this is the foundation of the fireplace and that's only gonna get uh, worse. The car, this was just standard information on the car. Um, these are some other, um, these are actually in Seminole Heights and the reason I'm showing, I know they are not in Hyde Park, but City of Tampa, it's a, trans it's a um, transportation is citywide and 
and Seminole Heights and Hyde Park are very similar, the same size alleys and everything. So these are a couple that I just wanted to kind of point out. This is actually on the block where my office is. There's two of them. Um, this one right here, which is only about, um, about four, a little over four feet. And you can see there, and then this one's a little bit further down the alley. Um, it's about nine feet from here to the property line. So we looked at what's the minimum size for a garage. Well, nine or 20 feet by 12 feet um, gives you enough room to get in the garage and get out of your car and walk around the car. So we looked at different scenarios. Obviously this one was discarded because you can't have an attached garage and it's too similar, but it gave us the proper backup distance right here. But, but we had that issue there. Another alternative that we looked at was, let's just put it all the way back here. Well, by having it back here, it meets the setbacks, it meets uh, eve to eve separation, but my client is having to back down this extremely long, very skinny um, driveway, and then, and then eventually possibly have a potential conflict if there's a car parked right here when she's trying to back out. So she wants to be able to um, pull in and through the garage. Another scenario was this one, which provides setbacks, building separation. You enter from the side. This is a little bit less than 24 feet, which the city of Tampa transportation typically requires, but it's not the historic pattern. It's in the wrong location. We, you know, that's always a very important consideration is to keep that, that view corridor and have a garage door at the end of the, the driveway. So this is the one that we settled on and it, required us to get three different variances. Um, the first is trying to locate the building. You know, the side property line is a given, three feet, but trying to balance being not too close to this so that there's some building separation there, um, but we cannot meet the eve to eve separation. That's why we're going to zero because they actually overlap. But this is a one-story roof. This is a two-story roof. So, uh, so that's one of the issues that's created by this. The other is the vehicular entrance setback. Um, it's required to be 18 feet. There are other portions of the code that let you go down to 15 or even 10 feet, but uh, 18 feet is what's required. And we're at eight feet, nine and a half. And then the, uh, the maneuvering distance pulling out or backing out is um, 24 feet is what the city of Tampa typically requires, but we have 19 feet. This is very maneuverable. I know city of Tampa has their transportation standards. So what we did was we went to a parking lot and we marked off with some cones and some little plastic pipes uh, 18 feet 10 inches which is what we're proposing this uh, parking space right here is eight foot wide and then as I mentioned before we have 18 foot 10 there so I have three videos that I'm gonna show I'm just gonna put my computer up on here light can go off but um, sorry, let me get the that's her you can see she backs in in one continuous motion into the space and again that's an eight foot wide space our garage door is currently eight foot but we're we're probably going to make it nine feet so she has more uh, there's one more. I mean, there's two more. This is her. I have her leaving to the left and to the right. So.
and I did not have to jump out of her way on that one. And then this is her pulling out, going the other way. So I think I covered, oh, that's it. I'd like to, uh, the owner to come up and review the hardship criteria or response to the hardship criteria. Can we do that or do we need to stop right now? Um, we'll let you do that during your question period. We'll, uh, we'll just stay. Oh, sure. Okay. Why don't you take okay. the opportunity? Yeah. Thank you. So there's no staff report review for the variance. Um, is there anyone in the audience, I mean a staff report for the variance part of the case. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to come forward to speak either for or against the project at this time? So we have city transportation. Yeah. Commissioner Ron Vila, as part of the public uh, portion comment, we do have letters of support that are in your package as well. Thank you. Uh, I know it's a little redundant because I know he's already referred to it, um, but uh, there, there's there's two uh, code there's two code issues uh, for this part. First is uh, transportation finds the site plan inconsistent with Chapter 27283.12b, which is as I've been here before, you need if you're accessing off alley, you need a 24 foot backup. Um, you can include the platted width of the alley, and this is, I believe it was like 18 feet, 10 inches or something. So they, so in order for this site plan to be approved, you're going to have to have a variance to reduce the, from 24 to 18, 10. The second one, to clarify, which is uh, trans transportation found it inconsistent with Chapter 27, 156C, 4-28, it's actually a table, um, the structural edge of a garage coming off an alley is set back 10 feet for two vehicle garage, which is what you see mostly. Usually I'm here over 10. It's 18 feet for a single, single vehicle garage, which is another reason you don't see those as much. Actually, lately there seems to be a lot more of those. Um, so, you know, I, so uh, I believe it, it actually would have to be set back almost like a further nine, I don't know, nine feet, two and a half inches or whatever in order to meet that code. So you would have to change that as well from the, from the 18 feet from the property line to whatever the, it is. so those are the two issues for the variance. And I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, any other? person that would like to come forward that's here tonight in the audience, either for or against the project, the variance portion. Okay, seeing that, we're going to go ahead and close the public uh, comment period and uh, begin our questions. We'll go ahead and allow the applicant owner to come forward and read the variance uh, component into the record. Hi, I'm Mike Eisenfeld. My wife and I are the owners of the property. Welcome. So um, I'm not going to ask you any oh, questions. You this just... is the opportunity for you. Okay. Because we would we would ask, could you read through it? Yes. So the, it. you have these two, but I'll read through no, on number one. The existing property is narrower than the original platted plot in 1920, and the distance to the adjacent home on the east is much less than typical, and compounded by the fact the driveways are adjacent and do not have proper clearance for the driveway to be used simultaneously. Both properties are on substandard lots. The size and configuration of the existing house driveway and existing detached accessory structure do not allow for reasonable parking clearances or covered parking. The only reasonable location for covered parking is location of the existing accessory structure, which needs to be replaced but cannot be rebuilt within current zoning standards. On number two, the existing house was built in 1920 and sits in its original location. No substantial improvements have been made to the exterior of the house since we purchased it in 2022, so just a few months ago. The proposed variances will allow the smallest vehicular storage area as practical. On number three, the proposed accessory structure will not substantially interfere with any of the adjacent properties because propo proposed building is no closer to the adjacent properties than allowed per Chapter 27. 
number, on number four, the requested variance is consistent with the general intent and purposes of this chapter and the adopted Tampa Comprehensive Plan by allowing modest size detached accessory structure for vehicle storage and, and additional accessory ancillary space as reasonable use. The proposed variances will allow the smallest vehicular storage area as practical. And on number five, the property owner should be able to use the property the same way as their neighbors and to have an accessory structure to store vehicles. Most, if not all, the neighbors on the street have two car accessory structures. The variance requested will allow storage of one vehicle and maneuvering space consistent with surrounding homes in the historic district. Similar properties have covered vehicle storage but do not have the extra burden of a substandard lot with reduced area for vehicle storage and maneuvering. The requested variance would provide relief and enable the same reasonable use of the property as surrounding homes and property owners have for covered vehicle storage and maneuvering. Substantial justice will be done allowing the variances to accommodate the hardships and practical difficulties that need to be addressed to provide covered vehicular storage for at least one vehicle. And number six, the proposed structure meets all the requirements of the Hyde Park Design Guidelines and the Secretary of the Interior Standards for construction of a new detached accessory structure, scale massing setbacks, orientation and site coverage, alignment, rhythm and spacing are especially important considerations for this project considering the existing design constraints and the historic patterns of the development. Um, so what that, in addition, I just wanted to say that goes along with that is that we, we've we loved, of course, to have a two-car garage, but it's just, you saw on the, on the plans, it doesn't fit. It wouldn't fit no matter what we were looking for. So we went, we're going with the one-car garage and keeping it in historic, you know, look and everything and trying to keep it, it the way it should be, but it requires, and just to build the building alone, it requires that to have these setback variances. It wouldn't even be possible to build it if we didn't have the variances, other than an attached garage, but that's not allowed either. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, so we're going to ask some questions and um, start with Mr. Sutton today, or this for this case. I'll take on that. Um, Could you illuminate for me, please, sir, um, the quirk of why we have an eve to eve separation issue? Follow me with this one second, please. Um, we have a, a site plan diagram that indicates a touching of an eve. One is a one-story building, and the other one is a two-story building. And it strikes me that there would be a, se a given separation, however vertical, between the two eaves. The constriction is brought to you by a fire safety issue where you would have, um, you know, fire leaping from uh, one immediately adjacent building to the next. But we don't have that condition here. We do not have two uh, uh, one-story buildings in immediate proximity to one another. How or who came up with the variance? The mayor. Um, that that was discussed at the HPDRC meeting uh, about getting the variance for building separation. Um, I, the the eaves, yeah, they're not touching. They're they're just overlapping. Um, you know, one's lower, mm -hmm. and then the higher one is is over it. I'm not aware of anything in the code that uh, for for buildings of the same ownership on the same property, with having to meet was it Table Six Hundred or whatever in the Florida Building Code. I think that's only for uh, properties on adjacent properties. Mm -hmm. um, so. That's how we were told to notice it, and that's and that's, that's where it is. Excuse right. me? And, uh, and all the parties involved were well aware of that the proposed uh, uh, accessory structure is in fact a two-story structure. Yes. Okay. Thanks so let me interject, Ron Vila, with historic preservation. As each project comes forward and goes through the process, we have the different uh, city departments review the project 
for compatibility with, with their um, underlying codes. It has always been measured, and this is a building code separation issue for the transfer of fire, as you indicated, but it's a vertical plane from eave to eave. Although they're in different planes horizontally, that code requirement is still in place, so that's why it's being advertised this, this evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Vila. Next. I have no questions. Mr. Taylor. I have none right now. Okay, Mr. Meyer. Um, I also have no questions. Thank you, Bill, for a very complete presentation, including videos of people driving around. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just have some questions to clarify, Mr. Dobbs. Can we go back to the uh, diagram of the alley with the different distances that you had sure. called out? I just want to get the numbers correct because I think they're a little different from what we have in our paperwork. So uh, if okay. we could look at the vehicular entrance alley from 18 feet to 86 is what we have, but I think you had 87 something. Okay. So these were the these were the diagrams that I had done early on. So I need to look at the actual site plan. Okay. That was submitted to okay. make sure the numbers. Correct. I just want to make sure we have the correct numbers. The eight you. seven is the. What do you call that? The apron. The, the and the eighteen is the distance from the door to the other side of the alley to pull around. Right. We're we're talking about the first one, which is the clearance from the rear of the structure to the property line. Right. So uh, that is that is called the vehicular entrance from the alley. The so right. Right. We. So you're saying that you're looking at something that says eight foot seven? No, eight no, no. Six. And I see there it says eight foot nine. I just want to clarify what each of these dimensions should be. Should this go forward as an approval? Okay. We need to make sure the numbers are correct. And it seems to me that there was some variation in what we saw in the diagrams, and I just want to get it clear for us. Okay. I think I can explain. I noticed it as eight foot six from yep. 18 to eight, eight foot six because I wanted a few inches to kind of play with because okay. property lines and stuff always kind of are not parallel and stuff like that. Right. So what we are, um, what we're actually proposing is, is eight foot nine and a half, which is what is on the site plan, I believe that uh, the board has that they're reviewing. So you're still asking for the eight foot six though, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. And then for the maneuvering clearance, it's from 24 to 18 foot six. Correct. Correct. Even uh, though you have 19 on this drawing, uh, you still again, want that yes, I was wiggle. just trying to be conservative. Okay. All right. Good. I'm good there. Any other questions for the applicant or the owner? I had a question for transportation, um, and I think you answered it. But I just want to. If this were a two-car post garage, you said the setback would be different. For the for the, the twenty, you'd still have to have meet the twenty-four foot for the backup. Uh, but for the the other one, which is really more of a siting issue, um, a sight line issue, it would be ten feet. But because it's a one, it's the eighteen. It's eighteen. Okay. Thank you. Dobbs, you have uh, five minutes rebuttal time. I would just like to emphasize the, the four uh, options that I showed. You know, we, we, we truly tried to look at every option for the minimal. We need, obviously, a two-car. There's no way that's going to uh, work as far as what uh, Michael had said. So, uh, anyway, so, yeah, that's just what I wanted to emphasize, that we had looked at every op other option available. Thank you. Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. Say, Go ahead. Um, as Ron mentioned, there's no street parking. We have to have a place to park, and you saw the, the ribbon driveway is shared, the, the, the one ribbon of the two. And we intend on you know, rehabbing, making the ribbon di driveway exist and look even better than it looks now. But in reality, I mean, in practical sense, the two cars can't go. Like if they have their car parked in the driveway, it's, I mean, it, in theory, it fits by the inch. 
but in fact, we have an SUV and, and the neighbor has an, a sedan. The only right way it gets, back, gets by is our mirrors above their mirror. It goes right over when we back up like that. So that's, that's a, I would say it's a true hardship. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We're good? Uh, yeah, we're good. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll go ahead and close this portion then, and we will begin discussing the, the variance portion of the case. Anyone? Anything we need to discuss? What's this? I think it seems, it seems we have encountered a true hardship here, and not one that is, has been created by the current owner. And I don't think the design, you know, as presented, the size of the garage or, the, or anything is beyond what it absolutely minimally has to be to, to have a car in it. Um, it wouldn't fit in it. So, uh, you yeah, know, your, car, your car would. No. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely minimal. I have no issues with this proposal. So I assume that's the, then we're going without conditions. If, if that's what you would like to put forth as a motion, you yes. may you may contain okay. that motion All if right. you'd like Thank to. Thank you. I would <laughs> like to move that the variance request for case ARC 23-120 for property, property located at 2108 West Marjorie Avenue be granted as depicted on the site plan presented at the public hearing for a variance in the vehicular entrance from 18 feet to 8 foot 6 for a variance in, in the maneuvering clearance of the width of the alley from 24 feet to 18 foot 6 and a variance in eave separation from 5 feet to uh, 0 for the eaves and gutters based upon the petitioner meeting the burden of proof with regard to the six hardship criteria set forth in section 27-1 114D of the City of Tampa Code of Ordinances for granting variances, as stated and the evidence provided in this public hearing, specifically that the existing property is narrower than the original planted lot, and the requested variance is consistent with general intent and purpose of Chapter 27. I'll second. All in favor, please say aye and raise your hand, indicating so. Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Let's move on to the certificate. <laughs> okay. Do I need to reintroduce myself or just continue on? <laughs> nope. Assume I can continue on. Okay. We'll start with the with the site plan. And so everybody's familiar with the, the vehicular access. So when we come back here, uh, my client wants to put a gate here, and I have some imagery of that to secure the backyard area. This right here is the, is the form that we were um, using to describe the variance, but they want to try and get like a workshop or some extra space on the ground floor. So we're putting that right here, and it is step further back here. I have a larger site plan so you can see a little bit better. Shows a little bit better. So this is five feet. So we're doing it five feet, number one, to give more uh, visibility uh, when pulling out of the garage, but also uh, a mechanical equipment has a three foot setback. So we're going to have an AC unit here and there, there may be a future spa or something. So we'll put that equipment here. So that is um, an additional space. As I mentioned, as part of the variance, we were looking at separation here. Uh, the solid line there is the second floor roof, which you'll see in the elevations. It, it, it um, actually um, doesn't seem as tight as it looks in the plan, but we wanted to keep enough um, room here so that you can circulate from the, here to the backyard. And then the stairs are directly up right here. Then uh, we have a ground floor porch and we have a, um, a second floor porch. So I'll show the, um, the floor plan. Um, so, so we just have the garage with the, the two doors at each end, and then we have the, the storage space here, and then we have a, a porch or covered area, which is stacked with what we have on the second floor right here. 
so right now we're this is just open living and then we're gonna have the bathroom and stuff here we're still kind of playing with this plan but that but I wanted to show this to sort of talk about the uh, fenestration when we look at the elevation so with this roof it's always a challenge massing wise and architecturally when you have an l-shaped building you can do like two cross uh, gables or intersecting ridge lines this building so narrow we wanted to um, look at other opportunities for the massing that would make it very simple um, and uh, make it feel a little more substantial but not too substantial so rather than doing a ridge this way intersecting with the ridge this way which doesn't work cleanly because we have this bumping out what we did was we had this main um, roof here with the ridge in the middle and then that ridge steps down to a lower ridge so you have this gable inside this larger gable and that forms also repeated on the front so from the front it looks like a 12 foot wide building with uh, uh, a gable now we did extend it a little bit further over this way for the uh, to cover the stairs which you'll see that in the elevation zoom in a little bit so so you can see the front elevation we have the the gable inside the larger gable with the roof extended in a decorative bracket that was one of the staff comments and I have a, a detail of that from the alley we have the garage door and and then we have the second smaller massing here and that's where the equipment is down there that's all beyond at the house um, this porch is not screened in this was just the graphic thing that I do to show that it's covered recessed area so it's not a screen porch it's all open um, some of the details while I'm on this elevation just smooth hardy siding to match the existing house um, the casing trim around the uh, aluminum clad wood window is going to match uh, the existing we'll have uh, similar but smaller brackets on this building because we have smaller overhangs because we have the the two foot uh, distance we need from the property line to the uh, combustible material which will be the rafter tail and then we have um, you know a wood a, a very sim simple wood uh, railing here and then um, wood columns the uh, the elevation that faces the side the neighbor to the east um, we didn't want any windows on the ground floor so we just have a couple larger windows on the second floor and you can see how that that ridge line is working and then that uh, massing there stepping back and then on the um, interior elevation that faces west uh, there you see the sort of stack porch you have the stairs coming down here this area is enclosed I have detail to show how this works we basically have wood treads and then the risers come around and return so it kind of creates like a little wood screen and then here we have a couple large brackets you know for the roof extending over which will clear I mean, there's a full person there for scale and um, I have these other drawings in a little larger form, but I have window details, the, the bracket detail, and then the wall section and some other larger drawings. So this is the typical wall section. We have um, a one foot six overhang with the exposed rafter tail with the finished cunning groove soffit and a little overhang there and then we have the a window six foot eight head height and the ceiling on this on the second floor is eight feet um, the on the first floor it's eight feet as well with 10 inches of structure the the footing is going to be a, a thickened edge monolithic slab uh, I didn't note it here, but we'll have stucco or something to cover that, up, and then the siding will just come, come down. Some of the details I didn't mention the brackets and the elevations, but 
this house has two different kinds of brackets. Existing house, it has, I'm sorry, it's a little darker, but it has a little knee brace, but it also has a, a like a corbel bracket that just sort of sticks out. So um, I wanted to kind of point those out. And then also note the, the, the smooth, um, I think this house does have hardy siding on, on the back. And this is the, I'll zoom out a little bit. This is that larger uh, knee brace or bracket. Um, it's a structural bracket supporting this beam so the roof just extends out. Um, and then that's carrying the raft, the extender rafter tails. And then that's basically a six by six nominal. It'll probably be finished out at, at five by five inches, but have the same uh, edge detail there. The stair detail, I mentioned this This is house was actually under construction. This is the house up in uh, Watercolor, up in the Panhandle, but, um, I'm sorry, Water Sound. But you can see how the, the risers turn and go back. It creates a really nice uh, detail. So these are some of the other um, materials that we're using. Um, the windows are aluminum clad. Uh, Wood windows uh, is Sierra Pacific H3 um, is pretty much um, pretty standard for a lot of the projects that I work on. Uh, this shows again s some of the, the corner boards and the, the smooth hardy siding, um, the two different kinds of brackets and the, the exposed rafter tails, um, the simple uh, wood uh, pickets on the railing. Shingles, we're just going with the typical uh, dimensional asphalt shingle. Um, I already talked about that bracket detail. The garage door, we're going with the panel type uh, carriage house garage door. This will be the, the garage door that faces the front of the house, so we'll have glass panels there. But on the alley where aesthetics are less important, we'll still keep the same kind of door, but we'll have opaque panels. The lighting, just sort of a, a period style lighting that has a little bit more of a contemporary uh, flair, but with the, the dark bronze that's picked up on the, uh, the door hardware, which all the door hardware is gonna be similar to that, um, with probably the square instead of the round, pick up on some of the craftsman elements of the house, and then um, you know, that kind of uh, exterior door. And then again, the hinges and handles are dark red bronze. Uh, this is going to be the wood fence that goes along the alley on the back side of the house and along the sides of the house. This is going to be the metal gate which faces the front of the house. We wanted something fairly transparent there, and we didn't indicate the height, but this is going to be about four or five foot, maybe four foot high fence. It's not going to be really high, it's just to kind of keep animals out and things like that. So I'm going to just review the con conditions that the staff had. I think I probably covered everything. Um, shoot. I thought I had it here, but, um, but I think I covered all the conditions. So. Um, if I miss anything you want to okay. okay, so yeah, so that will conclude my presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioner Ron Vila, staff with Historic Preservation. Very uh, complete and thorough presentation. All the conditions on the staff report on page three and four have been addressed through the presentation this evening. Staff finds this application is consistent with the Hyde Park design guidelines. I'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Vila. So at this time, if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to come either come and speak either for or against this project concerning the certificate of appropriateness, you may do so at this time. Seeing no one, we'll go ahead and move on and close this portion of the hearing for this case and move on to commissioner's questions. Anyone have a question? Please? If I may, sir, I'd like to open up with a question regarding your brackets. 
Okay. You've showed us this evening uh, a detail of one bracket. Uh, if I want to say anything about it, I would call it a large format bracket. Uh, it's pretty beefy. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you are planning on using this bracket over uh, in conjunction with your extended roof over your stair to the second floor. Um, first of all, do you have a detail of the smaller brackets you're using at the other points on this building? No, I do not. Okay. Are you intending to use the same manner of, uh, of mass member, if you will, as on the larger bracket? No, on, on the house, those, I think they're like three by, uh, or um, four by six brackets, the corbel that comes off the porch, mm -hmm. the, the knee, um, the knee braces, I believe those are, are four by four. Okay, that's but existing, but you're th talking right. about making things smaller because of this more diminutive project. Right. Well, part of it was a proportion thing because just because the bracket is so, uh, so large to, you know, uh, that um, the three and a half inch, I actually drew it as three and a half inches and it looked a little, a little thin, you know, so that's why I beefed it up to um, five inches. I call, I'm calling out the six inch nominal, but you take five and a half inch and plane it down. Mm -hmm. Oh, I understand inches. that. Yeah. I understand that. I'm just wondering if, if something uh, of that kind of mass is really appropriate for, uh, uh, for this more delicate structure. I mean, it's a diminutive structure as it should be. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if, it, if there's a certain degree of, of, of size, massive heft um, that could, could be manipulated in some fashion, mm -hmm. either through a change in material or uh, how the pieces come together or how the pieces themselves are dressed to help make it feel smaller, mm -hmm. lighter. <coughs> I, oh, hold on. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, a really important character defining feature like that, because it really is considering its location and everything. Mm -hmm. um, something like that, a lot of times what I recommend to my clients is to, is to either mock something up or study it in a little bit more detail. I think given, and I, I agree with what you're saying, you know, with the proportions, I think, you know, one was too small, maybe this one's too big. Maybe we look at something in between or some other uh, more simplified uh, design. If, um, and we could certainly, if, the, if it's acceptable to the board, you know, work with the staff on that to get that nailed down to what it really, what looks best and most appropriate. Thank you very much. Anyone else with a question for the applicant? I have none. All right, five minutes for rebuttal, because I have none as well. Just, just the bracket. Um, I, I feel like I'm very detail oriented, and those details to me are the most important thing on these craftsman style homes. So that that is a very important detail to get correct. So uh, we will definitely, if it's acceptable to the board, work with staff on that. Thank you. Thank you. Before you go, can you leave the uh, primary elevation up for the new garage? Sure. ahead and um, move on and close this portion of the hearing and move on to commissioners discussing the case. Is that good? Yes, thank you. Can we open the and then maybe we can close? Yeah. So we are in the discussion portion. I like it. I would I would say, you know, from the aerial site plan, I was scratching my head going out in the world. But then... Yeah, that's why roof know, plans really are not the, the best things the, to look at. The elevation <laughs> came up and I said, okay, it works. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I agree. I, I'm pleasantly surprised when that came up and I, I actually really do like it. I think it works. I, I think other than the bracket discussion, which I actually had as my only concern, 
So thank you, Mr. Sutton, for nailing that one. Um, I do, I do think the scale of that is just way out of whack, especially when you look at the primary structure and you look at its overhangs and the brackets that are supporting that. I know it's not a four foot overhang, but the uh, they have a delicacy to them, mm -hmm. and they're still doing their job. So. Um, and, and I know that um, the elevation is showing the outline of a figure, but I can just imagine someone who's slightly taller, <laughs> and I have a few of those in my family, um, and you just never know, people monkeying around and stuff, so, um, but I think that the primary concern is the architectural presence of it, so I think other than that, it's, it's a great project. Well, well done. thank you. Does anyone have an issue of what we've not seen yet presentation is, uh, if you will, a view of this proposed accessory structure from the street side. From the relationship. Okay, and its relationship to, to, the, main house. to the main house. Uh, because we've got that long, slow, low, you know, one story uh, primary dwelling, this, this two story thing just peeking out from around the corner on the back side. I, I don't have a problem with it because that's, that's, that's the de facto prototype for I think the, any size of a house. I think the fact that it reads primarily as this very thin, diminutive piece and the other, and you know how it's gonna look in real life, right? The, the shadowing over, over the daytime, right? And the piece is gonna push back and hopefully that bracket gets smaller. Um, <laughs> that, that really, you know, that, that primary vertical facade, I think it's gonna fit really nicely with the, with yeah, the property. Yeah. 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 And it is a canyon between those two houses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna even be able to see a portion of it from the street. Mm -hmm. you know, that's More than likely, yes, but then again, not really having a, a really good idea of the vegetation. I, mean, I don't think we ever saw a really good view, even from the staff report, of yeah. that whole relationship. And I wouldn't even be asking the question if this will, if this bungalow is more like an, of an airplane type bungalow f format where it has right. a small cupola and ball over on the second right. level. <coughs> there would be a modulation to that. This is a, this is a very, very, mo this is a very simple building. It does have that marvelous um, um, little roof element over the front porch. And um, I think that will help mitigate some of the high low effect between the main yeah. building and accessory structure. I also think it's so far back. It, it, it's it's really far back from the from the street. Mm -hmm. From the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe if the neighbor parked a big SUV in front of it. <laughs> you won't even see it. <laughs> well the, the roof line to me is what I mean I, I, again I think he nailed that. Yeah. I mean, normally that's where we see projects potentially fail. I agree. Can we entertain a motion at this time, or do we need to discuss any other points? Let's see here. I move to grant a certificate of appropriateness for the drawings and documents presented at this public hearing in ARC 23-120 for the property located at 2108 West Marjorie Avenue. Uh, with the following conditions, and that is uh, for a further co uh, coordination with staff respecting the scale and massing of proposed bracketing for your new roof on your accessory structure. That's based upon the finding of fact the proposed project is consistent with the historic Hyde Park uh, Historic District guidelines and the City of Tampa for the following reasons that we are dealing with a, a accessory structure of a compatible scale, height, width, and massing of building form consistent with the neighborhood and with its parent structure. I have a second. I second. And before we go to our vote, do you understand the condition put forth here tonight in this certificate? Yes. Of yes. All right. And all those who, um, all in favor of the motion, please say aye and raise your hand and indicate you so aye. 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 Passes. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, Commissioners. Ron Beal. I'm staff with Historic Preservation. The last agenda item that we have is ARC 23 
124. This is for the address of 710 and 712 West Platt Street. This is in the Hyde Park Historic District. Currently, it's a vacant parcel. It does have two zonings attached to this parcel. It has a CG and an RL1. Uh, in working with the agents, we had them modify the site plan to show the dual zonings on that parcel to ease the presentation this evening. The request is for a variance for a rear yard setback from 20 foot to 10 foot with a two foot encroachment for eaves and gutters and for a certificate of appropriateness for an office building with site improvements. As we did in the last, last case, we asked the agent to pare down the presentation to address the variance portion first. So they will receive the 10 minutes associated with the variance. There is some past action that's associated with page three of the staff reports. In 2006, there was a contributing structure there that was uh, reviewed and approved by this governing body. And it is no longer there, obviously, because it's a vacant parcel. Just recently, in uh, 2022, there's been a series of requests. It initially came forward for a rezoning, which uh, first ended in a 2-2 tie vote, which was automatically approved and on August 1st, 2022. After that, uh, their team came forward uh, a couple, uh, the following month, uh, and because of a lack of a quorum, uh, did not, was not heard. And then it came forward at a later date and uh, received a denial uh, as a recommendation to move forward with a three to two vote to, to move to forward to city council. Since then, they have adjusted the site plan and elevations. They, the PD request is no longer in front of you and they're in front of you for the variance in a certificate of appropriateness. Um, as part of the, the hardship for the variance portion, it is attached to your staff report, once again, so you could follow along through the presentation. Uh, moving to the photo portion of the presentation, on uh, your monitors, you have the Sanborn map from 1929. This is on the corner of Platt and Fielding. There is an alley that's to the east of the subject site that runs north and south that will be uh, play uh, a valuable component this evening. This is the subject site here, uh, highlighted in the green. This is the vicinity map. I know it's very difficult to read, but the, the reason I included this here is just to show you where it's located. It's located on the, the northern boundary of the uh, local district. This is the subject site. Once again, you have Platt and Fielding with the variant, uh, excuse me, with the alley uh, to the east of the subject site. This is looking at the site from Platt. You'll see that there are a couple of curb cuts associated. There's one on Platt. You see how Platt has been reoriented. It's a double, it's a one-way street with two lanes, then it's bisected with a bike lane, and then there is some parallel parking along Platt. This is the other curb cut. This is along Fielding. If the project is to move forward, these should be uh, reinstalled into Parkway. They are not using either of these for vehicular access. This is the abutting contributing structure to the south. This is looking down Fielding and the street conditions in both directions. And this is looking back out towards the intersection of Platt. You see Platt is a one-way street as indicated by the sign. This is looking down Platt once again. These are the, uh, the lanes um, coming into downtown and then you have the bike lane and some of the parking. This is a contributing historic structure that's just to the west of the subject site which is over here. This is Platt and Fielding. The subject site is to the east of this intersection and this is a period building to the west. Once again, looking down Platt, so you get an understanding of the environment. This is looking at the condition of the alley. This is uh, looking back to the south. This is the subject site here. And at the intersection of the alley and Platt. And the last photo I have is the subject site. This is the alley. This is a non-contributing structure that has more of a, a suburban 
um, footprint for the parking in the front, and this is plat. Uh, these pictures will be here if you need them through the presentation. At this time, I'll have the agent address the board on the variance portion only. Did you get help from? They think you need a break back there. They think you need a break back there. Yeah, I don't know where my icons went. Where's the North Hyde Park? There's a thing far right. Yeah. Far right. Nope, that's not it. Still in there. Anyway, we'll go after it that way. Need some help finding them? Yeah, well, remember, we put them on the yeah. desktop, and now they're not there. Okay, so we go right there. That one? That one. And presentation. And then the show. There we go. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Kevin Smith, I'm the uh, architect for the project and the agent. Um, my office is at 1909 West Patterson Street. And with me, I have uh, Jesse with uh, Blackstock Engineering, the civil engineer, the owner's rep. And uh, last time I joked that I had all the villagers with pitchforks. Well, now I've only got one villager and he left his pitchfork at home. So Warren is the attorney in the house just south of our project. Okay, so this is uh, ARC uh, 23124 at uh, 710 and 712 Platt Street. Um, we've done this a few times before, so uh, I hope you have a memory of where we've been and uh, what we have done. Okay, let me get this to work is um, try to meet all the requirements of the existing conditions of the zoning and the site. So, but uh, also from our last meeting, there were some comments about the parking that needed waivers, uh, massing, and setbacks. So I'd also like to address those. Uh, okay, we are um, uh, going to show that we're going to meet uh, those requirements. So um, we're requesting the variance, as Ron said, to uh, reduce the rear setback from 20 feet to 10 feet. And uh, because of the shape of the R01 conditions, it's hard to determine where that rear setback was. So we uh, had this discussion with Heather Bonds with the city to uh, determine where front, rear, you know, and side setbacks are. And we'll get in that. Now, the other um, item that I want to show you is uh, what we have done to meet the uh, historic uh, parking guidelines in the Hyde Park District. So uh, I'm going to go through this, and uh, I may uh, have uh, Jesse summarize at the end simply because it's past my bedtime. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, I like this slide. Um, I showed this to you before that's going to show all the setbacks. Um, and just quickly, CG has a 10-foot setback on all the front side, rear, pretty easy. Uh, R01 has a 25-foot front setback, 7-foot sides, 20-foot in the rear. And uh, in this case, I don't believe we have a corner. So, I don't know if you saw the line that just popped up showing the R01 zoning and the CG zoning. Um, that line is uh, very important, and we uh, took great efforts to find out where it was. <clears throat> and as it turns out, um, that line is uh, just outside of the 10-foot CG setback at the C CG rear, if that's coming out clear. So if we were to design a building in the CG uh, zoning, we'd be outside. We would not be touching the R01 area. Here, and I'll, I'll get into that a little more here. So there, the blue showing the uh, CG setback. Continue. The orange that you just saw fade in is the buildable area in the R01 district. Uh, how we determine that. Here, the green box is showing the 25-foot front uh, setback, and uh, fielding is the front for the R01 zoning. And next. So the side setbacks of seven foot are indicated by the green again, and you can see it's just short of where the 10-foot CG setback would have been. Next is the 20-foot rear setback, and this is the area that we are asking for the variance. Let me do the next, just so it's absolutely clear. And you can see what we're after, trying to get uh, that 20 foot down to the 10 foot setback of CG so we don't have a mismatch. And uh, also will help us with other uh, guideline requirements. So next. So the variance would only impact the alley and the medical clinic adjacent to us on the uh, east side. And I also want to point out the uh, medical clinic is set back to two and a half feet from their property line. Um, and they're also in the same zoning of CG R01. So, you know, you can see the uh, red, uh, hot, uh, something's not right here uh, in their zoning. Oops, okay. So, how, how and why we're doing the zoning is to deal with the strange uh, configuration of the R01 lot, but also to meet the um, parking guidelines uh, for Hyde Park. So what we did, and a little bit of historic review here, the red line is where we first got together. That was a three-story solution, um, almost 8,000 square feet and uh, the filled in red area to the, my right is uh, where the building footprint was. So after meeting here and uh, meeting with uh, the neighborhood, um, we made adjustments and tried to work with the, the existing zoning. So what we did was spread out the design to the uh, C CG zoning uh, re reduce the project to two stories, so there is not a three-story component whatsoever. And uh, <clears throat> it all works, except that back corner, uh, the rear, so back in the R01 area, that we're looking for the variance. Uh, just to cite some square footages, our last visit here, the building was 7,169 square feet. Um, this current design is now 5,838 uh, with the uh, net uh, second floor area at 5,192. And 
as uh, the words just popped up, we're trying to get all of the parking contained within the building footprint. So from uh, Platt Street, you would not see any uh, vehicles. Okay, so uh, this slide is showing that we have 18 parking stalls designed, which would allow for 5,940 square feet. Um, the current design is under that number at 5,838, and that's a difference in delta of just over 100 square feet. So we do not need a, a waiver or any consideration for parking. It all works within the design. And here in the yellow, which again just showing the area that we're asking for the variance, which then would allow us to get all the parking within the footprint and to uh, uh, capitalize on the, uh, the strange part of the site in the R01 zoning. Okay, uh, so Jesse, I think I need to, if you would summarize, please. Oh, sure. Good evening, Good evening for the record. Uh, Jesse Blackstock with Blackstock Engineering, 1646 West Snow Avenue. Um, I think just to quickly summarize a little bit, Ron kind of touched on it as well as Kevin. This project came through various processes, but mainly the rezoning request that we had several ARC hearings for. The main reason we were asking for a rezoning to begin with because this property is dually zoned. It's mostly CG, but it has a small sliver to the rear or to the south, in this case, as R01. It had different height restrictions, it had different setback requirements than CG, and it, uh, we were also driving for a bigger building, which required more parking. So the more square footage, the more parking we needed. We were asking for parking waivers. We were asking for waivers on height because of the difference in 35 feet in the back and 45 feet allowed in the front. And then we were also asking for setback issues because we, we have the same setback issue we have now so we've reduced all that as kevin pointed out we've lopped off the whole took a haircut basically in the whole third story of the building which further reduced parking requirements and square footages so i've got just a little bit of time left so the, the main thing is the, the reasoning really from a hardship standpoint is the regular lot size not size but geometry of this that's that southeastern corner is tough to work around we need that for that stairwell it's up against an alley the existing setbacks for the various historic structures that are in this area, not only the medical clinic, but the ones to our west on the other side of fielding, have minimal setbacks on the side. It's, it's considered a side, or in this case, a rear setback because of its on a corner. The Land Development Code says a corner lot shall have a rear setback defined by the smallest lot dimension. So that's the main reason for it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. Appreciate mm -hmm. yours. Uh, we'll go on to the public comment portion if there's anyone in the audience who would like to come forward and speak either for or against the, vari the, the various no. portion <laughs> you may do so at this time and have you been sworn in sir i have okay. uh, my name is warren harris i'm the adjoining property owner i have the uh, building that's located at 304 south fielding avenue uh, right next door i've been there for about 28 years it's been my law practice and uh, now I actually live there, I live upstairs and the law practice is downstairs. Um, I had some initial concerns about the property as the plan was initially uh, proposed, but um, this plan seems appropriate for the neighborhood. Um, I have no problem with the setback variance on the alley. Um, the alley uh, is appropriate now, even though the fence is there and uh, that cuts down the uh, size of the alley, but for the few people who use it, it's uh, very effective. Um, the only other concern I have is my access of driving from uh, my parking area through to the alley. And I understand the plan is being developed so that I'll have access to reach from my driveway to the alley. So with that condition, I have no objections to the property as it's being proposed. Thank you, sir. Any other member of Thank the audience? Thank you, You should be an attorney. Do that full time. <laughs> so, Mr. Smith, we're still in the public comment period. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to come forward and speak for or against? No? So, um, we're going to close the, uh, we're going to allow the commissioners to ask questions now. So, if anyone has a question for Mr. Smith or Mr. Blackstone at this time, or staff? I have none. None. Mr. Pickle. No. 
None. Taylor? None. I have none either. So uh, you have five minutes for rebuttal if you want to add anything into the, Oh, you know what you do need to do? I'm so sorry. I'm not even thinking straight. So um, we didn't go through the variants. Items and typically we have the applicant go ahead and read through here to enter into the record. So, if Mr. I think Kevin's volunteering you, but um, yeah. <laughs> if we, if you want to, you have this time to enter into the record the um, responses to the variance questions. Did you bring that? I did not. But here we, we have it in the record. So. <laughs> Why don't I draw the short straw? Uh, so what do we need to do? Uh, answer each question? Just read from our answer to this question. Okay. The, uh, the, could you do this? Thank you. Good evening, Commissioner. And so for the record, the, uh, the various questions and responses uh, num question number one is the alleged hardship practical difficulties. The two parcels are located at 710, 712 West Platte. Both have dual zoning designations, R01 and CG. The hardship of this project is the building setback requirements that differ between R01 and CG, as we just covered a minute ago, and it's specifically the rear setback. The geometry of the parcel also makes it a challenge slash hardship to allow for the R01 setbacks of 20 feet to be met. Uh, number two, uh, the hardship practical difficulty does not result in actions of the applicant. The two parcels that make up this project are both existing vacant lands. The dual zoning and geometry of the parcels are existing and not self-imposed. Number three, the proposed, pro uh, that the variance granted will substantially interfere or, or injure the health and safety and welfare of others. The proposed projects were set back variance from 20 foot to 10 foot in the R1 zoning area of the project is primarily limited to the stairwell in the southeast corner of the property. Further, based on our research, the existing buildings that are immediately adjacent have similar reduced setbacks. Uh, number four, the variance is in harmony and serves the general intent and purpose of this chapter of adopted land development, I'm sorry, adopted Tampa comprehensive plan. The variance to reduce the rear yard setback from 20 to 10 feet is along the alleyway of the project and the closest use is the legal office to our south and the medical clinic to our east. The side setbacks approximately, the side setbacks are being met, so the only affected use is the medical clinic, which is a setback along the alley of approximately two and a half feet. Seven feet is required for the R01 uh, zoning of the clinic. The number five, allowing the variance will result substantial justice being done considering both the public benefits intended to secure by this chapter. Uh, to allow for the variance would allow for the full use of the parcels in keeping with the required stairwell in the southeast corner of the project. The front and side setbacks of the project are being met and the rear setback is very, the rear setback associated with this variance is limited to the alley and primarily stairwell in the southeast corner of the building. Uh, number six, it, the variance, if granted, will allow development that is consistent with design standards compatible with historic district. Uh, so to summarize, the project setbacks are in accordance with the city's zoning code, Chapter 7, with the exception of the rear setback being reduced from 20 feet to 10 feet. The reduction is compatible with the historic nature of the West Platte Street and the existing developments surrounding our project. Thank you. Sure. Yes. This one. Um, no, I guess I want the floor plan. If we floor plan. Go back the other way. Yeah, go forward. I'm sorry. With this one. That would be perfect. Thank you. You want the green line? Um, no, that's, yeah. that's, that's good. good. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, did we use all the five minutes there for their rebuttal time? The clock's not started. I know I messed that up with the uh, variance component. I forgot. Who's our timekeeper? We didn't do the time. <laughs> you restarted it. So did they get five minutes or not? Okay. If there's anything else you'd like to enter into the record that maybe we missed, okay. Yeah, that's it for the variance portion. Okay. All right. Then we're going to go ahead and close the public hearing and move on to um, our discussion regarding the variance. Remarkable um, presentation that you've brought to us for this variance. Uh, slideshow information 
very clearly presented, uh, very compellingly presented as well, for that matter. Uh, it's going to make our decision and discussion on this uh, quite, quite, quite well. Uh, I was involved with, I think, your initial uh, presentation with this, and the issue of what was that little leftover RO site with respect to that uh, was not nearly as clearly presented at that time as it was here tonight. This makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I'd say the same thing. That, that how uh, how the presentation worked with the the uh, fading in and out of all the colors to show what's real, what's this, what's the setback, what's the zoning, what you know, all that was very effective. Good graphics. Um, I love that slide. It made things very <laughs> clear. It made things very, very clear. And it's appreciated. Well, I agree. And I, I do want to commend the whole team for going with what you were given and trying to make it work rather than coming before us with 10 different requests. So congratulations. Other than that, are there any concerns, any points that we should consider? I just want to clarify that the the only variance that you are requesting. Uh, we're past the question period. This is us discussing. Oh, that's just us discussing. Yeah. <laughs> and he did clarify it. Okay. It is, it is as it is. stated. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I made a Thank note you. of that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so there's only that. Yeah. Anything else? All right, any uh, motion to entertain? Anyone? Move that the variance request for case ARC 23-124 for property located at 710 and 712 West Platte Street be granted as depicted on the site plan presented at the public hearing for a variance uh, in the rear yard setback from 20 feet to 10 feet with a two foot encroach encroachment for eaves and gutters based upon the petitioner meeting the burden of proof with regard to the six hard cr hardship criteria set forth in 27-114D of the City of Tampa Code of Ordinances for granting variances, as stated, and the evidence provided in the public hearing specifically that the project setbacks are in, ac in accordance with the City's zoning, zoning Code Chapter 27, with the exception of the rear setback being reduced from 20 feet to 10 feet. The reduction is compatible with the historic nature of West Platte Street and the existing developments surrounding the project. I have a second, please. I'll second. All in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Indicating so. Aye. aye. Passes. So we move on to your certificate then. Thank you. I don't drink, but I think I'll get one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, next on the uh, appropriateness, I want to go back. Uh, here. Well, maybe I don't want to. Here we go. Um, a lot of the discussion that I, I'm going to present next will be about this massing and setbacks. And I'm just going to read inconsistent within the area. Uh, that kind of left me at a loss because I know we were meeting all of the zoning setbacks. So I'm going to take that as historical significant setbacks, meaning adjacent buildings in the Platte Street corridor. So now let me try to run a, nope, wrong way. This is the bad side of uh, having self-executing PowerPoints presentation. Okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, I'll start out, and I also want to add that I didn't know I was going to be doing this till the middle of last week when Ron gave me a call and said, well, if this works out, why don't we go for it? So uh, I did my best to put this together, and uh, we'll see uh, where it goes. So first, uh, I wanted to have a brief discussion about setbacks. Uh, I did this drawing of the adjacent area showing all the other structures in the neighborhood. Um, again, the CG zoning is the 10-foot setback. And uh, as you can see here, the uh, brick house to the west and the fire station to the east are probably the most significant uh, historic structures. And you can see both of which have uh, two foot or under 
front setback, and we're definitely uh, shown better than that, meeting the CG requirement. Then as you go down fielding, um, the uh, law uh, office just to the south um, has uh, a 10 foot setback, which we are matching. Now, let me go forward. Oops, wrong way. So what I want to point out, all of these um, structures or residences along fielding are in the R01 setback. You can see the blue bars showing the front setback and none of them meet it. So it suggests they were all grandfathered in over the years. So uh, again, I want to prove, point out that I think we're doing better than the neighborhood. Uh, so next, I just blew it up so we can see exactly what's uh, going on on the setbacks. And then it occurred to me, what are the real comparisons? You know, what on Platt Street should we be looking at? So I came up with these two newer projects across from Walgreens, uh, 300 Platt and the Diago uh, Plastic Surgeon. Uh, well, it looks like they would have had to gone through this pro process uh, more recently. Again, two-story solutions um, and uh, in uh, CG and the R01, same kind of problems that uh, we had to address. So uh, as you can see, uh, their setbacks are 10 feet and uh, 300 plat. I don't know how it got to seven, but there it is. And you can see where the R01 line is uh, cutting through the buildings of newer design. And I just made it gray, so you know, it screams at you. So <clears throat> being in the R01, uh, I, that told me that then they were probably meeting the requirements of height and uh, massing to meet that requirement. And it's obviously they did and the height it would be uh, 35 feet for R01. And maybe the little peak of that roof over the balcony on the Diago Center might be pushing 35. So uh, um, I'm gonna continue here and just to show you that the front setbacks are off uh, Hyde Park and then plant again um, it looks like they had to get a variance to make that uh, work with their buildings. All right, uh, again, a little history review. Uh, this is the building design when we first met. Three stories, uh, almost 8,000 square feet. Um, I had to go through the learning process with everyone. Thank you. And this is where we're at now. Uh, on two-story solution. Um, most of it is 32 feet, so well under 35 feet of uh, the uh, R01 uh, requirements. And I uh, left the stairwell that is in the CG zoning um, tower where it was, but I made the uh, roof that's currently about 39 feet and changed it to a hip roof uh, rather than a flat roof, just because I thought it would read better in the district. And the reason I am making that peak higher is I want it to be red from the street. You know, if we go with a lower sloped roof, you won't even detect that there's a, a barrel tile roof on the project. So that could easily be adjusted if need be, but uh, I think it works out much better. And um, so you can see where I placed the R01 CG lines so you get a feel of where it hits uh, on the elevation and it truly is that rear stairwell uh, area. So with uh, the heights the way they are, we have no need to rezone or variance or anything. It meets all the requirements. Um, if you don't mind, I don't think we really need to go through. This is all the requirements of the guidelines. I presented this last time, and uh, I'd kind of like to get out of here. So, uh, I mean, you can stop me here. If uh, Last time I presented uh, all of these requirements, and uh, I'll show you what the graphics 
how we were doing it with the pushbacks here and un undulations of the facade. Um, and then the, where is it at? And then just uh, the facade and adding the roofs and uh, the punch out of the tower. Next, we've got the rhythm of the windows that reoccurs, um, medallions uh, placed throughout, and uh, brackets. And then we showed the entrance feature, so it screams, here's where you get in. Uh, the requirements uh, that I were given said show uh, uh, wall sections. So here we are, uh, this is cut, the one on the right is cut through the entrance area, and just beyond is that stair tower. Um, you note there's a column base, a column with banding, and then the uh, roof structure with uh, brackets and uh, uh, stucco facade wrapping. The uh, stair section is much simpler. And in this case, this one is showing at the rear stair, so there's uh, not as much decoration as the one at Platt. So next on building materials, here's, uh, I'm showing the elevation, and this one is looking from uh, fielding. And then I took a snip, snippet of my past uh, renderings, so we can point to it and show you what we're up to. Uh, we do not have many uh, personnel doors on site, and we definitely don't have many for the public. But I do not want to do a flush hollow metal door. You know, I want to do something more decorative. So this is one suggestion uh, that I was looking at, and it uh, doesn't have to be this one. But you know, again, anything but a flush metal door. And uh, the red square shows where those are. Uh, next on the column, bases and capitals and wraps. And I'm looking at a uh, bull nose of uh, solid material as this one is showing. And again, the red uh, circle showing some of the areas. Inside of the parking area, I uh, really did not want to have a flat wall meeting a flat ceiling, so I'm suggesting we do some just a bit more with the crown molding. And here's a suggestion of the bracket uh, that I'd like to use. Um, um, coming up, I would uh, suggest that we use just one bracket throughout, one style of bracket, one size, and in this case, the um, the soffit uh, overhangs are two feet, so this bracket would have to meet that dimension. Then the uh, medallions, and I showed a circle on some of the locations where they were going. I would like to keep it uh, simple and understated. And then the um, Spanish uh, tile roofs that are used throughout the uh, Hyde Park District. Uh, showed some of the locations where that would be. Um, but when I showed family and friends and even other architects, they said to me, I like your Spanish design. And I was like, oh, this isn't Spanish. So what I'd like to do in that case is keep the barrel tile, but let's take a look at a different color. You know, that might work with our uh, color scheme for the whole project. And next, uh, when I first conceived the base of the project, and um, we've got a planners, and then the column bases, and then another base on the perimeter of the project. Um, again, could go with the standard reddish brick, um, but I really think a different color is, if we look at the brick house to the west side of the project, it's a brick, but you wouldn't know it because it's all whitewashed. So uh, that's kind of where I'm going, that perhaps this base is light gray, white, tan. 
some one of those. Then on the face, faces of uh, the exterior walls, um, it's all uh, cement plaster, and this whole project will, at least at this point, will be a concrete structure, and that will de be determined by supply issues. You know, if we can't get steel bar joists, we'll have to do something else. And in my previous experience, just recently, uh, Holocore slabs were available. So at the time of uh, when we go into the drawings, we'll have to see where we're at. But right now, uh, I like to do a fine textured cement plaster finish and not the one below, the one indicated where if you touch it, you'll rip the flesh off your arm. <laughs> And then <clears throat> on the uh, lintels and uh, sills and columns, I'd like to use a finer textured cement plaster uh, to get some uh, difference and contrast between the two materials. What do we got next? Windows. So an office building, we're sticking with uh, fixed windows uh, trying to be uh, reminiscent of the single or double hung window. So the real trick to this is selecting a, a frame size that is the right scale. And then putting in the intermediate you know, elements that again are smaller but look proportionate. So that's what I would try to do with the storefront system. And of course it would be hurricane windows. And at least right now, I'm showing a, wind, a white or mill-finished aluminum uh, framing for the opening. And because you asked for it, I just came up with a hardware, uh, looking at some of those handicap uh, accessible, yet help reinforce uh, the look of the project. So, back to history. Again, here's where we were. Came back again, trying to put a balcony and cut off some of the uh, third storiness. And then I showed you the elevations, and that's what I got for appropriateness. Your turn. <laughs> so we'll move on to the staff report, Mr. Viva. Good evening, Commissioners. Ron Viva, I'm staff with Historic Preservation. As we re review every project, we look at the application of standards, we look at the Hyde Park design guidelines and the scale and the massing and the setbacks and the other items that are addressed on page 69 and 70 as he alluded to uh, this evening. So staff's finding that this application is consistent with the Hyde Park design guidelines. Under the conditions that were associated prior to the presentation this evening, uh, he did address many of the items uh, stormwater was addressed. It, it appears to be uh, an underground system. Uh, he did not show any fencing. I don't know if it's part of the presentation, but he could uh, elaborate that as we get into questions. Uh, I did show some abandoned uh, driveways uh, onto the site, one on plat and one on fielding. If the project is to move forward, those should be reintroduced into the parkway with a uh, turf to complete the uh, the, the historic relationship from the curbing to the parkway to the sidewalk into the private property. Uh, that should be in condition. If there's any uh, hardscape that is going to be uh, associated with the project, it should be addressed. I don't believe he touched upon that. He did go through a comprehensive material palette. Um, and one, one uh, last item that I have, is it appeared through his sections that the windows are gonna be put in the middle of that wall plane. Uh, if this is masonry um, a construction, I think that could be achieved, but have them elaborate a little bit more of the implementation of the windows to the facade. And that completes my portion. Thank you. So move on to the public comment portion of, the here, of this portion of the hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to come forth and either speak for or against the certificate of appropriateness? In this case, Cindy, do you love us? No, I'm good. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and close the public comment uh, portion, and we'll begin asking questions. 
starting with Mr. Prokop, if you have any. I don't. Mr. Sutton? Well, we do have the, uh, 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 the list uh, that we're trying to uh, pull together here, but let's start <coughs> with this. Um, are you at this time prepared to uh, present a solution for uh, the Parkway restoration for both Platt Street and I guess that's what, Hoover? Yes. For both, for both those locations? Are, are you aware of the consideration that we're talking about? I am not, Judge. Nor am I. Okay. Um, situation is uh, there exists uh, two substantial curb cuts, aprons, um, whatnot, uh, in all on Platt Street servicing your, your site and the other one on fielding. You will not be using these anymore because you're accessing everything from the alley. So it comes out. How and what are you going to do okay. for restoration on those? Okay. That, that's what I was hoping that was when you meant for parkway restoration. Absolutely, yes. That was yeah. part of our initial. Of class, you have to make that into a curb improvement. <laughs> right. I didn't know if you meant like bike improvements or something similar to like the no, 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 the striping no, no, and such. Uh, no, we, we fully intend to remove both existing aprons. That's actually part of the. We went to the rezoning transportation staff actually requested we do that, but we were going to do that anyway because initially we were going to ask for more parking. That was one of our justifications when we came in with the rezoning. So that's mm -hmm. the long answer. But the short answer is absolutely. We're going to curb it. We're going to make it look like on either side of the apron. And maybe put back an actual parallel space in front of the driveway apron that's there now. Another parking meter space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, because that's one of the concerns of, of not Mr. Warren, but some of the other residents and law firms in the area when we were asking for a waiver of parking, they were like, you know, worried that we were going to have a driveway on, on fielding initially because people park along fielding. On the in the northbound side, I'm sure transportation so. will have their fingers in this, but I yes. think that will also be something for staff to to, to yeah. coordinate with as well too. Yeah, there's a brick paver driveway in the southwest corner on building. We're taking that out, and then the actual concrete, you know, guy on plat is coming out. Now, uh, this site or a pair of sites, if you will, have been largely abandoned for who knows how long now. Yeah. Um, what, are you, what are you doing for your hardscapes? We have really two to consider. One, sidewalks and or sidewalk repair. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have your vehicular uh, surfaces. Yeah, so the sidewalk we are going to be repairing as needed in these apron areas for sure, obviously. Mm -hmm. But the intent is to maintain the sidewalks that are there now in terms of the, the walkability and to have them along both fielding as well as mm -hmm. along plat. We're not intending to install any sidewalks along uh, the alley, for example, because we're going to have spaces directly, you know, 90 degree head, on, head in off of the uh, alley. All of our surfaces, though, are going to be on site are going to be asphalt. Okay, so that's the so intent. Unless you tell me special. otherwise, we would use concrete for aesthetics purposes, but it, the, the minimal would be asphalt. They are paved, though. No okay. pavers and. The and sidewalks. The Correct. Which which screen are you looking at? This guy or the, the one the, you have up right now? The black and white one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't see what you can see. I, I mean, I can see it on here, but so where do I have a mouse? I'll zoom in. Sorry. Do I have a mouse to point? Okay. Out? Oh, there it is. So the existing sidewalks are outside of our limits. I'm not saying they're outside limits of our construction. They're just outside the property boundary. No, so no, 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 no. So where do you see sidewalks? On your are, on your plane. Right here. Right there, and then the stippling to the bottom below okay. the stair tower so those, and the parking. Okay, so that's the pedestrian access to the building that we're trying to maintain right Correct. through here. And so the intent would be to kind of, we've lined that up with basically the access aisle. But that's the, your but that's your sidewalk, correct? Correct. So the question is, yeah, I'm what's sorry. the material for that? Because you said all surfaces that you install on your property would vehicular, be asphalt. Vehicular surfaces, I'm sorry. These are pedestrians. So yeah, the, the sidewalks are gonna be concrete to match okay. the existing concrete. Good, Same good, thing good. here to the south. Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't that's quite, that's quite all right. Yeah. I mean, we didn't cover solid waste, and that wasn't a question, but we are now identifying where that is located mm -hmm. is, as far is, as the storage of it. Is all of that indicated on this drawing, the notations um, for the surface? Because uh, we can't, we can't we read can. what the notes say, but was this entered into the record with staff as well? Yeah, correct. It says new five-foot concrete sidewalk. Okay. Yeah, I'm then, usually pretty good about labeling a concrete if it's, okay. yeah. Especially if it's a city project. As long as it was entered into the record with st mm -hmm. staff for this, and we're just clarifying it, it's not a condition. 
I'm not identifying the asphalt, I can tell you that, because we're just not that, that far along yet, but that's obviously what's intended. Hey, on the um, From a parking standpoint. Parking solid waste, I uh, created an area for barrels, so they're tucked away and hidden until it's time for pickup. There's a note on that as well. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and um, stormwater, uh, we're doing underground retention, and that's also shown on Jesse's drawing. Oh, those are the chambers, right? Underground. Okay. Chambers. And then on, there is no fencing, just the it's perimeter the of the building. Did there, I? There was initially, I mean, kind of going back to one of the other questions regarding as, uh, parkway restoration. This mouse is going crazy. This looks like a driveway. It's not. This is more. If you're parked here or here, I hate to see parking spaces when you're trying to back out and you got to back into the other guy's parking spot to get out. So that's just merely some extra room to get out. It's not physically, there's a curb here, so it's not physically connected to this drive. This is the existing driveway we were talking about earlier. That's the being removed. Head in the yeah. parking lot. That's being removed, and then the existing apron here is definitely being removed and, re and repaired, restored, if you will, to biker better condition. Right, right. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Did they answer the questions that Ron brought up? Mm -hmm. Not at this time. Thank you very much. Mr. Myers? No questions. Mr. Taylor? Ron did bring up the uh, window location as far as where it was sitting in the wall. So could you clarify for us what the intent is there? Pardon me? On the that. window as far as where it's set into the wall. Ron right. You mentioned that question. Uh, well, when I uh, drafted it up, it would not meet the block coursing. So is it? So there would be a small curb. Oh, <laughs> John. He's, he was asking about the placement of the actual window mm -hmm. this way in the wall, not vertically. We, we know that you'll try to meet your coursing. <laughs> what, we're, what we're getting to is historically, we like to see you know that shadow play that we see in historic openings. Right up there. But you go back to your wall section, and it wasn't very. Go forward to your wall section. Okay. Yeah. Take me a second. That one. Yeah. Can you zoom in to the one on the right? That's beyond my ability. Is this just Can we a go to the... No, let's go. Okay. How do we get this screen back? It's okay. Um, so, Mr. Smith, when, when we're talking about installing our windows, right, in the opening and you've got your masonry opening of whatever you're doing, right? Nine, 10 inches. Where is the front face of that frame sitting? Oh, in the block wall. Right, but how got far it. back from the front stucco face is mm -hmm. it sitting in that condition? In the so do you have it out flush? Do you have it recessed? Got it. Um, well, when I drew this mindlessly, I just put it centered. Uh, but I think I would prefer to go uh, uh, slightly flush or slightly outside uh, the face of the wall so it reads better. Does that help? To the inside or to the outside? To the, inside to the outside. To the, to the outside. Yeah. And it, and for historic conditions, we prefer that it, that the frame be recessed. Okay, done. From the, back from the face of the wall. <laughs> we we, we like that, that you started. We like mm -hmm. that you started in the middle of the masonry opening, but we're just trying to get to that idea of the actual detail that you'd like to see. Right? It's not just the shadow play. I mean, there's also water water intrusion detailing that you have to right. think about. Right? We we think about that all the and, time. Yeah, right? and, and I right? definitely and don't want risk. that. <laughs> right. So that's another reason why. Yeah. From, from a historic standpoint, the windows are recessed back from the face of the building to create shadow line. Yes. All right. Does that answer your question? OK. Next, Mr. Perfo, you have any others? I'm sorry. I don't have any other questions. I have no questions. Any others, Mr. Sutton? It seemed like you might have another. Like you had gone. Lost your train of thought. Uh, yes, I do have one more question. Uh, not indicated, but uh, are you doing anything specifically at this time with respect to exterior lighting, such as fixtures on the building, 
or uh, lighted uh, commercial signage of any kind at this time um, because it was not presented at this point in time. Uh, and it does have a, 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 a bearing uh, more so than just light spillage into something else, but does the character of the signage, does the character of the lighting fit with the context you're building in and the context you're creating with your building? Absolutely. So, no, I have not uh, hit that one yet. As I said, you know, I was slammed with this in the middle of last week, so I wasn't able to work through everything quite yet. Um, but agreed on the lighting and what kind of sconces and what they look like and the placement. Mm -hmm. um, and most definitely, I would uh, illuminate the building faces at night. Uh, and if we could uh, step back a second on a hardscape, uh, I originally was looking at some benches uh, and around the building at some strategic spots, uh, but the owner, uh, told me a, a, a brief story where they're located now on, what street are you, are you Cleveland. on? Cleveland. Um, she had a person chase her from the outside and had to run into her office because of the vagrant trying to get her and her staff member. And um, she suggested to me that uh, perhaps benches and anything that promoted a place to sit and sleep uh, would not be the best situation for the uh, staff in the office building. So at this point, I haven't showed them. Thank you very much. Um, so I do have a, a couple of questions as we've been talking. Um, where are your outside air units going? On the roof. They are. And how far back from the edge will they be set? Uh, they'll be centered. Yeah, I don't want to see them either. Try to get them as far back as possible? Correct. Okay. Um, obviously, you haven't sized them yet, so you don't know how big you're going to go tonnage-wise. Uh, no, but I know I would go with uh, several split systems okay. uh, to minimize yeah, the size of the unit and strategically place them. And it also makes it, if one goes down, the whole building doesn't go down. Right, right, okay. And then is there any landscape that you're considering at all? Uh, yeah. Jesse has yeah, done exactly. a whole so plan. We had a whole plan as part of the rezoning. So the, going back to the site. Could we look at that really quickly? <laughs> Do you have it? Well, I don't know about quickly, but yes. Do you have it up? Yeah, you? it's the last slide and all of this. You have the last one printed up? Yeah, I didn't print it. It's in the slides here. If not, I can talk to it. Either way, we'll get you covered here in a second. I think it is. Right, come on. The antenna is to me up while he's looking for it. The antenna is to me code. So to kind of simply state that is to have, uh, I think we have a, I forget if we have overhead or not along the front edge, but essentially a shade tree or 40 foot on center. Okay. Along fielding as well as flat and then a row so of shrubs. So trees on both? On yeah, both. I, I'm treating this like a parking lot, even though it's not a parking lot, it's gonna be a building facade. Right. I'm treating it like you can see the parking spaces. So I've got trees 40 foot on center and right. I've got shrubs three foot tall, three foot on center. Okay. At time of planning. And then All we're right. putting some in the back as well. I don't think we have. You have to go to like an older. Yeah, there it is, right there. So there, so there, yeah. Let me pull that up. Let's. Yeah, you can. So this is essentially. I mean, there's some modifications that have to happen because you've changed. The Correct. Plan. This is the older layout, but it's the same concept. The so intent. along the property, right. right. We're gonna have this. Obviously, the driveway's not there anymore. I'm feeling, it's that's that's an older thing. But what we were proposing were magnolia, gems, the little, the sweet little gems, mm -hmm. not the big grand floria, because again, we're kind of up against the road here, as well as the building. But that's what we're proposing there as well as along the back. Okay. And then we're staying out of the areas where the existing trees are here and here. Uh, one of the things from code is, uh, from natural resources, was to maintain this tree that's on uh, um, uh, his uh, property here to our south. We're still maintaining that. The building does not get into that root zone. And then again, we're using just a shrub row along here and here. Okay. So it's just to be the same exact concept, just tweak a little bit, like you said. So, and then ground cover all throughout here. We're not putting any sod in. So, something else to point out, probably. Feedback. Um, are there any other questions for the applicant? Are there any external external gutters, or is everything running to the internal? No external gutters. Oh, it'll be roof drains and piping internal. Yeah, I would add that. It kind of goes back to the variance you guys just approved. We asked for that encroachment in addition to the reduction in the setback to the rear 
That was at the time. I wasn't sure exactly to how this building was going to be designed, if it had E's or not. So we just asked for that to have, you know, kind of like previous uh, testimony earlier tonight, just kind of had that plus or minus in there. So, yeah. Okay. No gutters. Any other questions? No more questions, so you have five minutes for a rebuttal. So anything that you may have thought of that we should know about before we close the hearing? No. For me? No. The only thing I was going to, it's more of a question and we can get with Ron afterwards regarding lighting and signage. I mean, because we'd like to propose something that actually meets, you know, your all's intent well, and history a, of the Well, there's several line. considerations within the code from the historic district perspective. And of then course. there's also obviously from the building code perspective. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things we mainly get into, I'm just going to say this just to give you some, some of what I've seen in the four years I've been on the commission. What typically happens when we have uh, covered parking like this is the spill from the lighting. And that's a huge concern, especially now that one of your neighbors is no longer just using it as a business, but a residence. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about, you know, that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. We'll go ahead and close this portion of the hearing then, or the public hearing, and we will discuss the case. Mm -hmm. I think it's ready to go. Um, I guess this is like version number three. Um, this is a significant step forward. Uh, and I think that uh, it, aesthetically it has some bearing on what we see in the commercial strip for you know Cleveland and, and Platte Street. So I think uh, this will be a, a, a welcome addition. I, I agree. I think it, the, the, it's, it's scaled back down to meet the other major historic properties up and down mm -hmm. Platte and, and honors them and compliments them and doesn't try to uh, over, overtake them or, or overmass them. Um, and I think it, 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 it'll maintain a nice consistency down the street and be a great addition to the street. Yeah, the mass came down. Yeah, it got a little bigger on the footprint, but I think that's par for the course in this commercial corridor. Um, the only thing that, that I saw that, you know, is, is the windows, you know, I realize that can be something that can be done at the staff oh, yeah. level. Lots of, lots of detailed coordination. Um, yeah. You know, I'm never a big fan of the storefront type windows in these districts, but unfortunately, it's a commercial building, so um, I, I do think that's something that can be I do think coordinated. there are there are profiles that are available mm -hmm. that are more appropriate and looking for that slim line kind of perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know I see uh, you know the final coordination of the windows and doors. The lighting. Uh, yeah, the lighting and signage. Yep. Because we've got that going on. Uh, we do have some final coordination with respect to the finished uh, selections for the roof tile and, and, and Well, he, he stated that it would be Spanish tile, but he, he'd look at a different color palette. Color. So I think he was consistent in his material choices. It was just thinking about what it would actually finally be in terms of a color palette, but we don't get into we that anyway. We don't, no, we don't get into that. Yeah. Uh, but there's also the availability the Spanish tile, but if you end up going with the Roman tile, that's a different issue because it's available. Well, again, that's something that we can't we can't foresee. We're we're, okay. we're going off of what we're being told tonight, right? I mean, that can happen to anyone. True. Right. Uh, building illumination. If there's anything special with that, do we need to address that as well? Yeah, the exterior light. Yeah, exterior. Well, lighting. there's exterior lighting as a fixture. Well, let's say uh, you want to ring this entire building with ground lights up. I still think that that's something. Um, we often will get that in these ca in these cases, especially the commercial ones, mm -hmm. where they have a concept, but they haven't had, they haven't like sussed it all out yet. And we we tend to make allowances that they're going to follow. Obviously, they're going to follow the building code, and our staff's going to work with them to ensure that it's his, it's consistent with the district in terms of that's why I bring it up yeah that's why I bring it up because you know, so you call that we call that site lighting even rather than 
Well, they're still building lighting. We're talking we about exterior lighting fixtures and then site lighting. Site Atmospheric lighting. Atmospheric lighting. Architectural site Arch lighting. Here it's still site lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Atmosphere. It's actually called architectural lighting. <coughs> and, we've, and we've covered the hardscaping. Yep. And that's all. And it's a, and it's, it's a great idea not to put benches in this neighborhood. Okay. I, I mm -hmm. personally did a, a building just two blocks away. And they're, we went they're to just all furniture. Kinds of they're just furniture. So I wouldn't typically think that we would get into that very much anyway. But it's part of the hardscape. It's I, part of the exterior visible hardscape. It's not necessarily fixed. Yeah. So I don't consider it something that we normally get into. And this is all I have on my hand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, and and the, I just have remove and restore the abandoned curb cut that needs to be which they as which condition. which they already said they were doing, and it was on that site plan that he said was in the record. The okay. notes were on it. Okay. We pointed them out. Right. We couldn't read them. But we pointed them out. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think we're consistent on what we thought we needed to go. Can I add to this now? Anyone? Okay, well, my understanding is that Wait, we, we haven't made a motion. When we make okay. a motion, we'll ask you if you understand. Go ahead. <laughs> We're debating what that motion should be. So um, if anyone would like to entertain a motion at this time, please do so. You may do so. I move to grant a certificate appropriateness for the drawings and documents presented at this public hearing for ARC 23-124 for the property at 710 and 712 West Platte Street with the following conditions. That the applicant clarify with staff um, the exact window and door types as well as window relationship to the face of the exterior wall. Clarify exterior lighting fixtures, clarify signage, and clarify any site and atmospheric lighting. Uh, because based upon the finding in fact that the, the proposed project is consistent with the Hyde Park design guidelines and the City of Tampa for the following reasons, uh, that it's in compliance with Chapter 27 of the City Code and honors and respects the historic massing and scale of adjacent buildings on Platte Street. I will second that motion. And before we vote on that, do you understand the conditions that were put forth here tonight? I do, and I would enjoy collaborating in the future to determine those items. Okay. So um, all in favor, please state aye and indicate so by raising your hand. Aye. aye. Unanimous. Congratulations. Thank and you. You may go home now and <laughs> get you to sleep. You won <laughs> one. Fine. We are adjourned. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry, I have to open it back up. You, you can, you may um, go on. Um, we have an administrative thing that we need to do. We do need to enter a motion to enter all the uh, items that were entered into the record during our hearing tonight. There were several yeah. letters for a couple of the cases. I got ARC 23-119, but I didn't get the other one that it was entered into. Don't we normally have to put the case number in? Can't just we just do it all? Okay, all right, so I need a motion to enter all items that were move, presented this evening. Move to, to receive and file all submitted documents and exhibits Thank you. presented at this meeting. So I'll second that motion. <laughs> all in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Time to go home. Now we're adjourned. Did you write that down? No, it's, it's, it's actually...